Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to be starting shortly. Everybody that's on the floor that's standing, you cannot stand in the chambers. There's additional seating up in the balcony, very comfortable. The, when you exit the room, the staircase to your right takes you up there. No standing in the chambers. Please take a seat upstairs. If, when your name is called to testify, we'll give you plenty of time to come down. Thank you so much. I appreciate everybody's cooperation. Uh, make sure we're going to start now, so make sure you set all your cell phones to vibration. Should you need to take a call, you can take the call outside. Thank you so much, folks. Good morning, and welcome to the meeting of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. I am Council Member Francisco Moya, the Chairperson of the Subcommittee, and today we are joined by Council Members uh, Grudencic, Levin, uh, Reynoso, Barron, Perkins, that's who we have for now. Uh, if you are here to testify, please fill out a speaker slip with the sergeant at arms indicating your full uh, name, the application name, or the LU number, and whether you're uh, in favor or against the proposal. Uh, we will begin this, sorry. We will begin by hearing a pre-considered LU item C190305, uh, ZMK for the 6003 8th Avenue rezoning relating to property in Council Member Menchaca's district in Brooklyn. Uh, the applicant seeks approval for a zoning map amendment to rezone an existing R6 C13 district to a proposed C42 district along 8th Avenue between 60th and 61st Streets, which would bring an existing three story commercial building into conformance with zoning. Uh, I now open the public hearing on this application. Uh, and I call Richard Lobel and Frank, I'm sorry, I can't make out your last, Nor is it? N Noriega. Noriega, okay. Thank you. Council, if you could please swear in the panel. Please raise your right hand and state your name for the record. Richard Lobel. Frank Noriega. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and you'll answer all questions truthfully? I do. Thank you. I do. You may begin, thank you. Thank you, Chair Moya. Council members, good morning. Again, Richard Lobel from the law firm of Sheldon Lobel PC. I'm joined with, by Frank Noriega, and we're here to talk about this 6003 8th Avenue rezoning. So as can be seen from the circled area, this rezoning is, uh, encompasses a block front, and really half a block front, on 60th and 8th Avenue in Sunset Park in Brooklyn. And the uh, rezoning right now, the southern portion of the block front is an M11 district, while the northern portion, which would be the subject of the rezoning, is R6C13. You can see from the tax map that follows the exact designation of the area to be rezoned. There's five blocks fronting on 8th Avenue, two blocks fronting on 60th Street. The existing zoning is R6C13, which uh, would permit a building at a max FAR of 4.8 for community facility. And with the C42, we have the same residential uh, equivalent, which would allow for R6 type construction. The difference and the sole reason for the rezoning is that in an R6 C13, the commercial is limited to the ground floor, whereas in a C42 district, the commercial is permitted above the ground floor uh, onto the second and third stories. Uh, the existing building at the site has commercial ground floor, formerly had residential on the upper two stories. This was subsequently changed and there's now commercial occupancy. The reason that the rezoning has been so, um, so widely approved up until this point is because many of the buildings along 8th Avenue in this area have commercial use which goes uh, further than the ground floor. It goes up to the second and third stories and the photographs included with the ap application, a casual walk down 8th Avenue demonstrates that this is the prevailing condition. Uh, this, I believe, is why the community board was so heavily in favor of the rezoning, voted 33 in favor, uh, none against, and one abstention, as well as the Brooklyn Borough President and City Planning Commission voting in favor of the application. So the zoning change map, you can see this is a relatively small rezoning encompassing a very small number of lots, roughly six to seven lots. And again, with the uh, zoning comparison table, you can see that the bulk uh, setbacks, height, etc. all of these things are consistent, the primary difference being the commercial FAR, where the commercial FAR, the max commercial FAR, is a 2 under the existing zoning. Uh, under the proposed C42, it could be a 3.4. But again, the residential equivalent remains the same, and the community facility remains the same. 
We, of course, included photographs with the application, as is usual for an application of this nature. You can see that there's commercial designation on the corner property above the first story. This, this condition is essentially not permitted under the existing zoning. The proposal would allow this to be legalized, not only in our building, but in other buildings. Uh, I think the last thing that I'd add is as you walk down 8th Avenue here, many of the community board members who attended the hearing were very interested in this because they actually have the same condition. And we're hopeful that, uh, that, the, that this rezoning area could actually be expanded to include other buildings along 40th to 60th Street and 8th Avenue. Indeed, the City Planning Commission commented that the city should look to uh, an area-wide rezoning to, uh, to fix this existing condition. So that's really the bulk of the application, and Chair, I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you uh, for your testimony. Just a couple of questions. Uh, and I know you, I think you said this in the beginning of the, the presentation, but the stated rationale for this uh, zoning is to bring existing commercial use into zoning compliance. What are, what are the consequences of having a building occupied by uh, a non-complying use? So the, the non-conforming uses in this area, the, the consequences are actually fairly small with regards to the rezoning itself. If you have a three-story building under the existing, story, uh, the existing zoning, you could have ground floor commercial with two floors of residential above. Under the proposed zoning, that commercial, to the extent you had a mixed-use building, could be extended to the second story. So most of the commercial uses in this area are, uh, are uh, existing um, commercial uses like office use, professional office use, which are inherently uh, uh, consistent with that mixed use character. So uh, really the, the actual difference between the, the zoning districts is really allowing the commercial up to get, to get further up. And the, um, you know, in, in, in these buildings themselves, you could actually even have a two FAR for commercial if you wanted to be entirely commercial. So in this building, for example, the, I think the difference between the existing and proposed zoning would allow for an additional 690 square feet of commercial. So it's really not that much of a difference. Got it. And what are the, so just to go with that, what are the advantages of bringing the building into compliance and what led you to file this application? So I think that um, one of the advantages is that you're in an area which there's a lot of commercial activity. The subway, the end line uh, stops a block from the site. Um, the city themselves, as you can see on the lower left portion of the map, uh, re uh, rezoned in 2007 a rather large swath to C42. So I think one of the things is that in an area where um, commercial activity is high and you've got a lot of these existing commercial uses that it enables a uh, use that's more consistent along 8th Avenue here. And I think the second thing which is something that was really hit on at the community board is flexibility. It really enables these owners to, um, to allow for moderate applications in order to prevent them from having empty spaces here. Uh, if you want to keep your building with an existing ground floor, commercial, and residential above, you may do so under the, under the proposed rezoning. It just allows for uh, 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 the ability to go in and to really populate floors uh, when there's really no other legal use. Right. And is this application likely to encourage the conversion uh, of existing apartments in the rezoning area to commercial space? I'd say the answer to that is no for the following reason. And again, this was something we, we talked about seriously at the community board. Uh, I think that most of the individuals who were going to have residential there have residential right now. And so if you look at the buildings on our block, many of these buildings are built to a maximum FAR. They have a mix of commercial and residential uses. The, the sad truth is that many of the buildings along 8th Avenue here have basically taken it upon themselves to make these changes without going to the Department of Buildings. Uh, and you could see how, in, in, for, in our example of our building, really the additional 690 square feet of commercial is all they're getting as a factual matter out of this application. Mm -hmm. So the, the fact is that our applicant really wanted to do it the right way. And I think that, uh, I think that um, the existing residential on these upper stories, to the extent that the building supported, is fine and is going to remain there. But I think there was a recognition throughout the process that it's an area that's appropriate for additional commercial, and to the extent that we don't want to have vacancies in these buildings, that this kind of enables a seamless usage in that, in that regard. And still staying in that line of thought, is the application, is this application likely to spur any additional new development in the rezoning area? It is not. Um, the buildings that were looked at pursuant to the environmental assessment statement, uh, all, most of them are built out to 
uh, FARs ranging from 2.8 to 4.8. And so they've already maximized, uh, some of these buildings have already maxed out even under the community facility that they'd be able to do so. So really for a mixed use commercial building, um, the idea of essentially re redeveloping in light of an, an additional 0.6 of commercial, if they were gonna redevelop, it's likely they would have redeveloped already. And that's borne out by the negative declaration that we received on the environmental review, which said that they didn't view these as soft sites. Okay. And last question, are uh, the other property owners uh, in the area aware and supportive of the application? Uh, we, we had several property owners uh, on, on this block and surrounding blocks who attended the community board hearing. Um, so uh, it's our understanding that everyone at the community board and everyone who showed up not only spoke in favor but actually requested both to the community board and to me that night that we, you know, if we could, if we could just spread the rezoning over several more blocks. We're, of course, unable to do that. We're in ULERP, but, um, but it, we've no received nothing but positive feedback from the community board, uh, which is evidenced by their 33 vo uh, to nothing vote. Great. Thank you very much for Thank you, uh, your testimony today. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I'd like to call up the uh, next panelist, which is uh, Bruce Jacobs. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. My name is Bruce Jacobs, Coalition of the Rockaways, supporter of medical and religious freedom, U.S. Navy vet, 9-11 first responder, fighter for New York City. I have very much respect for this lawyer. However, to, to, to start changing, you know, variances in neighborhoods to go commercial, all you're doing is knocking everybody out of their neighborhoods. Because if you give one variance to somebody, you're gonna let everybody's gonna wanna do it. And then everybody that lives in residential in that neighborhood is gonna end up being thrown out of that neighborhood. And then I don't care what anyone says, they're doing non-compliance as it is in that neighborhood. Now they come here wanting to change their variance. They say they're doing it for commercial use. However, what about the residents that live in this neighborhood? Whenever you get a big commercial, and this is office space, you got plenty of office space in New York, it's gonna affect the people that live there. People in, in that neighborhood don't have all kind of money. They live there most of their lives in that neighborhood. They have homes. Some, some could take advantage of, you know, with commercial, not everybody. Then you're gonna speak about community board. People, working people can't make it to the community board. So you're gonna say what the community board said. What does the neighborhood really say? I don't care, you know, if you're gonna say on one aspect that the community board is what counts, then do it for all neighborhoods, what the community counts, what they say. Because I see that sometimes they don't count what the community board says in some neighborhoods but in other neighborhoods, what the community board says. Community board is not really the whole neighborhood. Because I know in my neighborhood, like in Far Rockaway, because my family lives in Sunset Park, but in Far Rockaway, people can't even make it to the community board and people don't even know when the meetings are and people are working. So like I, once again, like I said, I have respect for this lawyer. He's a very good man. I have respect for you guys. But by giving a variance to change a zoning to a commercial, you are affecting the people that live in that neighborhood. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. We're gonna take a brief pause uh, for just two minutes and then we're gonna get start restarted again.
Sorry for the delay. Uh, we are now going to uh, begin, but first let me acknowledge that we have been joined by Council Members Rivera and Council Member uh, Richards. Uh, we are going to start with our votes. Today we will vote to approve with modifications LUs 559 and 560 for the 44-01 Northern Boulevard rezoning proposal relating to property in Council Member Van, Bra Van Bramer's district in Queens. The application was originally propo uh, proposed would rezone an existing M11 district to an R7X and uh, R6B district with a C24 commercial overlay and establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area utilizing option one and two to facilitate the construction of two new mixed use buildings with approximately 335 dwelling units and approximately 156 off street parking spaces. Uh, our modification will be to remove option two. Council member Van Bramer is in support uh, of this application as modified. We will also be voting to approve with modifications LUs 550 through 554 for the Peninsula Hospital Redevelopment Plan relating to property in Council Member Richards District in Queens. The application was originally, propo uh, pro originally proposed sought approval for a city map amendment, a zoning map amendment, a zoning text amendment, and a large scale general development special permit to modify the underlying bulk and sign regulation. Uh, regulations. As part of the proposed zoning text amendment, the application sought to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area utilizing option one and option two. Our, modifi our modification will be to remove option two and to reduce the maximum permitted units, uh, unit count to 2,000 and 50 units from a proposed 2,200 units uh, as well as the related reduction in maximum permitted building heights. We will also be modifying the restrictive declaration associated with the zoning special permit by adding the local council member's office to the list of parties to be notified with regard to a, uh, to a school's uh, mitigation proposal, clarifying the school mitigation options by stating the inclusion of provisions for either off-site land or core and shell for annex space, uh, whether off-site or on-site, and specifying the requirement for specified phasing sequencing as provided in Exhibit G. Uh, Council Member Richard is in support of this application as modified, and uh, I wanted to turn it over to Council Member Richards for uh, some brief remarks. Thank you, Chair Moyan. Good morning. What a great day for the people of the Rockaways, but in particular for the people who reside in both Edgemere and Auburn, a neighborhood that has always had the potential not to only serve as a retail destination for local residents, but a tourist attraction alike. However, like many neighborhoods on the eastern portion of Rockaways, the challenges of sorely needed in infrastructure, affordable housing, and a lack of space for our young people to congregate were non-existent. This vacuum created immense challenges, such as the highest unemployment rate in Queens, high rates of obesity due to a lack of access to a supermarket in close proximity to thousands of public housing residents and homeowners. But today I'm happy to announce Edgemere Commons Project seeks to address these systematic issues. This project will serve as a template for what a resilient mixed-use development should look like in the 21st century. During a time when our city is facing one of the largest housing crises we have ever witnessed, this project will produce over 2,000 units of true affordable housing, serving a healthy mix of incomes as low as 30% AMI. The addition of much needed senior housing units is a big win for those who wish to age in place gracefully on the peninsula as well. I want my community to know that we heard you loud and clear on the need to ensure we aren't just building housing, but addressing the needs of our community as well. This is why I'm happy to announce the creation of a new community center, healthcare facility, supermarket, open space, and much needed local and destination retail as well. The combination of these will enable us to stimulate the economy in Edgemere and ensure our youth and their families will have a safe place to go. Lastly, I'm happy to announce we've reached an agreement with the ARCA companies and 32BJ, which will ensure we aren't subsidizing poverty jobs. 
Furthermore, the developer has agreed to a 35% local hiring and 30% MWBE commitment to ensure these goals are achieved. They've also agreed to a $2 million community and youth development fund for local CBOs to track the progress of this project. In closing, I want to thank the ARCA companies for their commitment to the Rockaway community, to Alex, Daniel, Simon, Ethan, and Joel, thank you so much. Uh, I look forward to continuing to work with you in the future. I also look forward to hearing from the admin by the land use vote on some other outstanding items as we move towards uh, the full vote on this project. I would also like to thank Chair Moya, Community Board 14, the Peninsula Hospital Redevelopment Task Force, and all of the community stakeholders who engage in this project. I would also like to thank my staff members, Malik Sanders, uh, uh, Ms. Ludi, uh, and especially Kelly Sexton for ensuring we could pull this project over the finish line. Lastly, thank you, Chair for your amazing work. I know I said lastly a few times, uh, but also want to thank the impeccable land use staff, Raju Mann, John Douglas, Amy Levinson, and Julie Lubin as well. And with that, I recommend the committee votes aye on this project. Thank you, council member, and uh, congratulations on a great effort uh, on your part and for the community as well. Uh, we also are going to be voting to pursuant to the council rules uh, 7.90 and 11.60. We will also be filing pre-considered LUs for the special natural resource resources district zoning text and zoning map amendments to remove them from our calendar. Uh, the application has been withdrawn. I now call for a vote to file the pre-considered LUs for the special natural resource uh, district text and map amendments to uh, approved with modification LUs 550, 551, 552, 553, and 554 for the Peninsula Hospital proposal, and LUs uh, 559 and 560 for the 4401 Northern Boulevard rezoning. Uh, council, please call the roll. Chair Moya. Uh, aye on all. Council Member Levin. Vote aye. Council Member Richards. Uh, also neglected to thank Sean from the Deputy Mayor's Office, but I vote aye and thank you to all. Council Member Reynoso. Uh, congratulations, Council Member Richards. I vote aye and all. Council Member Gordenchik. With congratulations to my uh, colleague Donovan Richards, I know that this, uh, this is an issue that has been percolating for decades, not just years, um, for many, many decades, and I congratulate him on uh, reaching this point, and I vote aye and all. Council Member Rivera. Aye. A vote of six in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions. The items are referred to the full land use committee. Okay, we will now move forward, uh, and as we go to pre-considered LUs five uh, 64 through 567 with the associated ULIP numbers uh, N190433 ZRM, C190434 ZMM, and C190435 ZSM, and C190436 ZSM for the Hermosa proposal relating to property in Council Member Perkins' district in Manhattan. The applicant seeks approval for a zoning map amendment to rezone existing R7 and R8 districts with a partial C14 overlays to a proposed C19 district. A zoning text amendment to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area utilizing options one and two. A zoning special permit to uh, waive accessory parking requirements and a zoning special permit to modify various heights and setback regulations. The height and setback special permit uh, was approved with a modification by the City Planning Commission, which reduced the total proposed new building heights by shifting floor areas to the lower floors. These approvals, as modified by the CPC, would facilitate a mixed-use development, and that would include community facility space and a 340-foot building with approximately 131 dwelling units, including approximately 52 affordable units. I now want to open the public hearing on this application. And uh, if yes. okay. 
I'd like to call up uh, Jennifer uh, Dixon, Dan Kaplan, Gloria Feliciano, Daniel Feliciano, and Alexis Smith. Council, if you could please swear in the panel, we can begin. Please raise your right hands and state your name for the record. Make sure that the microphone is turned on, the red button. I mean, the red light should go on. Yep. Daniel Kaplan. Jennifer Dixon. Dan Feliciano. Gloria Feliciano. Alexa Smith. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer all questions truthfully? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Good morning, council members. My name is Jennifer Dixon from Herrick Feinstein here on behalf of the applicant, La Hermosa Christian Church, joined today by the Reverend Daniel Feliciano, pastor of La Hermosa, Gloria Feliciano, who deals with programming at La Hermosa, Dan Kaplan from XF, FX Collaborative, the architects for the church, and Alexis Smith from the Manhattan School of Music. Uh, we're going to walk you through a brief presentation today that deals with the, the church, uh, specifically the church's programming that they envision for the site, as well as the actions that are before you today. Uh, just to orient you, the church is located at 5 West 110th Street. Uh, that's at the corner of Central Park and Fifth Avenue, as well as Duke Ellington Farley Circle. You can see it here highlighted in red. The property is owned by La Hermosa, and they've been at this particular location since 1960. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Daniel and Gloria. Good morning, council members. Uh, thank you for welcoming us here today. It's an honor uh, for us to talk to you about our proposal to revitalize La Hermosa Church and to elevate the, the lives of our congregants and our local residents. Our church, La Hermosa Church, has deep roots in Harlem and in New York City. We are the mother church for the Disciples of Christ congregations in the Hispanic ministry in the United States. The Disciples of Christ has over 3,600 congregations in the United States, 34 in New York. La Hermosa community of 90 congregants reaches hundreds of people every year through its ministry and events. Hundreds of our neighbors just helped us two weeks ago to celebrate our 81st anniversary, people from all over the city. Thank you for this opportunity. Gloria will be talking to you about our situation and our plan of action. Hello. Uh, this project is about the survival of La Hermosa. Okay. And like so many churches in Harlem and in New York City, our capital needs have grown beyond our ability to manage them. Uh, if we don't do something soon, uh, we may have to close our doors, and that's not what we are here about. Our community needs La Hermosa, but right now we are very limited to what we can do for our community. The building is in ADA accessible, and the steep marble steps to the sanctuary are hard for the older and disabled uh, congregants of our church. Our old uh, HVAC system means that services are too cold in the winter, too hot in the summer, and we have been brought to use only one third of our building so that we could be comfortable. Right now, we only use the first floor. We are proud uh, of this proposal because it maximizes the potential of this site. 
for ourselves and also to work with our community. It secures the future of our congregation, creating an inspiring space to connect with the community and our faith. It establishes a partnership with the world-renowned Harlem-based conservatory, Manhattan School of Music, which Alexa will be speaking about in a, few min in a minute or so. It brings the, uh, the streetscape of Duke Ellington Circle to life for every Harlem resident. Most importantly, the proceeds from the project will be reinvested directly back into the community, either by community services or for the church itself. With new funding and staff, we'll be able to not only relaunch, but expand many of our beloved programs that we have had to pause in the past, like our soup kitchen, child care center, and food pantry. And we'll be able to recommit ourselves to, the, to our most important mission, Harlem's children. Harlem kids don't always have the access to the same kinds of opportunities that our neighbors to the south do. We feel a real obligation to create a wholesome after-school activities that will engage young minds in our community. We're looking forward to our partnership with Manhattan Music, like we say, but that's not the only thing we want to do. We want to be able to retake the mission of the church that we have had to drop services as we go along. On Friday evenings, we want to provide that space for community kids to have a place for sports um, because we do have Central Park across the street, but in the winter and in the evening, there is no place for our children to congregate. We want to be able to help our local residents in emergencies by formalizing referral programs for drug and alcohol treatment of shelters. Within the first year, we would also like to create some job fairs and resume assistance, and perhaps shortly after that, some cooking classes and health workshops so that our congregation can live fuller and healthier lives. In the longer term, we want to be able to help new arrivals in the U.S. by reinstating our ESL classes, hosting immigration assistant workshops, and facilitating connections to pro bono lawyers. We will be hiring a volunteer coordinator who can oversee these efforts and recruit volunteers. So truly, this is only a start. Underneath our proposal is our deep com commitment to providing services to our community. And Alexa will be talking about our connection with Manhattan School of Music. Good morning, I'm Alexa Smith. I'm the Chief of Staff at Manhattan School of Music and I'm also the head of the Cultural Inclusion Program at MSM. I'm also a constituent of the 9th District and I live on 112th Street. Um, you're looking here at a product of public school music education. I got my first violin in fourth grade for free something my parents wouldn't have been able to afford at the time, and I spent all my free time practicing and looking forward to my classes. I went on to earn two degrees in classical music, including one master's degree from Manhattan School of Music, where I now work. Um, music, more than anything, gives students, especially young people, a place to belong. And I want to read you a quote from our, one of our favorite alums. You might know him, New York Yankee, Bernie Williams. He said, I made the connection that if I could put the effort and practice into it, eventually I could play better and better. I started applying it to everything I did, sports, certainly baseball, and more than anything, academics. I understand how powerful music is as a language and how you can change people's attitudes and do a lot of good, especially with kids. So while this project does seem like it's just about building a new high rise. Manhattan School is happy to tell you that we can ensure we stay true to the mission of so many notable neighborhood establishments, including the many famous musicians who have crossed 110 and 5th. We're hoping that our after school program can reach up to 1,000 kids in its first year and we'll offer curriculum in areas including jazz, classical, Afro-Cuban musical theater, hip hop with ensembles like choirs, orchestras, small ensembles, and individual lessons. The school will serve children K through 12 after school and would not only provide a safe and educational space for children to spend their hours after school, but would also afford parents who work a traditional workday free care after school. This could save a family anywhere from $30 to $50 per day in childcare, totaling thousands of dollars per academic year. 
This is a huge impact for most family budgets in its sustained income impact beyond the walls of the building. In contrast, our existing pre-college program at MSM, which is one of the foremost conservatories in the world, cost a parent about um, $10,000 per child per academic year. As a Harlem resident and someone who can certainly, who until recently depended on music to pay my rent, I understand the need for affordable housing, and I also believe wholeheartedly that as a community, we understand the need for programs like what we're planning for our youngest community members. So I invite you all to come up to Manhattan School of Music, if you like, on 122nd Street to see what we do. We started as a community school in this district in 1919 on East 104th Street, and we look forward to returning to our roots with La Hermosa at Duke Ellington Circle. So we're going to turn now to the redevelopment plan itself. Um, so you've heard why this is so critical for La Hermosa, why they cannot continue in their current space, and uh, why we are embarking on this process uh, to redevelop the site. Uh, turning to the site zoning, uh, it, you can see it circled there in red. It's split between an R72 and an R8 district. Here is a closer view of it. The, side, the site itself has this uh, seven-sided shape, uh, which is right on the circle here. So although it's a very important and prominent location, it's also very constrained by the awkward shape of the site and also by the split between the R72 and the R8 zoning district. Here are some context photos. You can see the church in the upper left-hand corner, the three-story building that exists on the site today, as well as Schomburg Plaza, which is directly across the street, with the two 34-story towers right there. Here are a few other views of uh, recently developed buildings in the neighborhood, and you can see down 111th Street in the two lower pictures. So the objectives really for the church and for this project are, of course, to provide this 35,000 to 37,000 square foot community facility space. This is envisioned to be a very large, flexible use space, which is going to be used uh, most importantly by the congregation uh, for their community programming that Gloria just walked through. Of course, critically also by the Manhattan School of Music uh, in order to provide their free on-site school program. And uh, also the uh, residential development will come behind this space and uh, will provide that critical funding for these programs and for the church to stay on the site. We looked at the existing zoning. A development under that zoning really does not work uh, for this purpose. It results in a very inefficient, uneconomic building. It does not have space uh, for these community facility programs. And of course, under the existing zoning, there is no mandatory inclusionary housing component. The actions that we are requesting are the uh, expansion of the C19 zoning district, which is currently across the street at Schoenberg Plaza. We're asking to pull that across Fifth Avenue, 200 feet into the site. Uh, this, will, this will allow the building form that we're proposing here. Uh, we are also mapping an MIH, Mandatory Inclusionary Text Amendment. Uh, we are proposing option one, which is looking at 25% of the floor area at 60% and 40% AMI. We're requesting a special permit. Uh, Dan will walk through the details of the building. Uh, that special permit was modified at the Planning Commission, and we are asking for a parking waiver. Uh, we do not think that uh, parking is necessary here. It's very well served by transit, so we're asking to waive the parking on the site. And with that, I'll turn it to Dan. Good morning. Um, uh, I'll just walk you quickly through the uh, building and proposal itself. There are three main opportunities that this project uh, uh, will provide. One is uh, space for the church and the music school, state-of-the-art, above grade, light-filled, with presence on Duke Ellington Circle and identity uh, from the park. The second is uh, new residential units and affordable housing along with that. And third is the opportunity to create a significant building at this very important location. Uh, in the, as you can see from this image, the tower is set mid-block, uh, halfway between uh, 110th and 111th Street, allowing lower scale elements to create both the um, uh, street wall along the circle on 110th Street as well as on 111th Street. Uh, the massing is created to establish a very strong civic and urban presence at this very important location at the northeast corner of the park on Duke Ellington Circle and as a gateway to Harlem. As was noted before, 
the tower. Uh, the building itself has gone through a remassing during the city planning portion of the Euler process and has been reduced by 59 feet and more bulk has been put along uh, the circle itself. Uh, the tower is now uh, uh, just a couple of floors, two and a half floors above the height of Schomburg Towers and is uh, an appropriate height. The uh, summary of area is um, uh, sh shown, the total floor area is about 226,000 zoning square feet and 11.29 FAR. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, church is about uh, 37,000 square feet, 1.85 FAR. The residential is 9.44 FAR. Uh, and as was said before, the height is 30 stories and 339 feet. We are looking for, uh, uh, we are proposing uh, option one in the uh, 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 MIH. Uh, the preliminary mix is uh, shown on the screen, 25% uh, uh, studios, 25% ones, and 50% two bedrooms. And this was a preliminary unit mix. Uh, just two more slides. One, uh, or this is the uh, presence, uh, a view of the, of the building from uh, the circle itself. Uh, on the left is 110th Street in Central Park. On the right is uh, Fifth Avenue going up. And you can see that the bulk has been redistributed to create a strong presence on the circle. Uh, and at night, great care was taken to create activity along the circle itself, including the ground floor, which will have a, a school and church lobby and, and event spaces. And on, of course, on the second floor, the major spaces for the school and the church. That together with the entrance uh, to the residential building itself will create a very vibrant corner at this uh, very important spot in the city where today is really a parking lot and an undistinguished two-story building. So in summary, uh, this project will create a permanent home for the church uh, that will allow them to uh, continue and expand their mission. It will allow for free um, music education provided by the Manhattan School of Music for uh, Harlem youth and residents, and three will provide affordable housing at this very important corner of our city. Thank you. Thank you. And just a couple of questions before I turn it over to um, Councilmember Perkins. Uh, you're, you're proposing to acquire air rights from lot 30, correct? Yes. Uh, are you looking to acquire additional air rights from the residential buildings on lot 40 and 42? Uh, no, so we're just looking to acquire air rights from the Bethel property, which is next door to us, as you said. Um, the zoning lot was established under the special permit application at city planning, so it's those two parcels, our parcel and the Bethel property. Okay, and I, I understand that the church uh, will be looking to bring on uh, a development partner on this project. Can you explain the, the rationale for moving through the public review at this point when project details are not yet firmed up uh, there is more uncertainty about the final program, uh, like will the housing be rental or home ownership, uh, bedroom mixes, are we going beyond uh, MIH to deliver more affordable housing? So, so understood, and, and we have had a number of questions about that. Um, the, uh, you know, the program details are, are certainly set to a certain extent. Um, you've heard a lot about the community facility programming. We have a special permit with a site plan approval. But I'm gonna turn it over to Gloria to talk a little bit about uh, their experience and why they made this decision at this point um, to go forward as the applicant. Okay. Um, we, we took, since 2014, the end of 2014, the church made the decision to move forward and for a year and a half, we, we spent uh, interviewing developers, interviewing church pastors, and other congregations throughout the city that had been in a development project. We decided to take our own destiny in our own hands because after a year and a half of dealing with developers, we realized that we would never get what we needed, and in the end, we would end up losing what we do have. This way, we, we, we went about getting a, a professional team to advise us, 
and to move forward with the EULA process ourselves. That way the church can make sure that we have a say in how much space we need and what kind of programs we want to work with. Okay. Uh, the church currently utilizes around 8,000 square feet uh, and has about under 100 congregants, uh, I'm told. Can you explain the rationale for significantly expanding the church footprint to over 37,000 square feet? So the church's existing building is about 22,000 square feet. They uh, did historically use that entire building um, over the years as the systems and the steps have become a problem. They have been further and further reduced to that 8,000 square foot footprint. Um, they ran uh, quite a bit of community programming out of the church when they had the physical ability to do so. So the idea behind this is that the expansion in the size of the building will accommodate them to return to that level of community programming that they did and will also allow for this partnership with the Manhattan School of Music, uh, who will also be utilizing uh, the same space. And do you have any plans uh, concerning local hiring? Um, we are, for the church's space, um, committed to local hiring uh, for the fit out of that space um, and, uh, you know, in continued conversations about the rest of the project. So yes or? For the, for the church's space. So we have the church's space and we have the residential portion of the building. Uh, so we are making a commitment to local hiring for that. Um, we for the church? For the church, mm -hmm. correct. Thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Council Member Perkins. Thank you. I just have a question or two. So I want to congratulate you on um, your project, and um, we're neighbors, Schomburg Plaza. <clears throat> so we are very um, happy that you are moving forward with this project, and we want you to know that whatever we can do to be helpful towards that end, which I'm pretty sure you got it under control already, mm -hmm. but nevertheless, don't hesitate to give us a call to let us know how we can be helpful. Thank you so much for your work. Not what's been in the past, been in the future, is even going to be greater. Thank, Thank you. you. And I know Council Member Barron has uh, some questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you to the panel for coming, presenting your project. I just have a few questions. So the church presently owns that site, and they want to expand to mixed use. So it's similar to a church that owned property in my district and they came with a plan that said they wanted to uh, have mixed use for the church and some community facility space on the lower level and residential above. But they came with a developer. They came with a specific plan because they knew once they brought the project, they were on the clock. So do you think that this is not premature to be here without a development team that would be able to answer the questions that the chair had posed? knowing that you're on the clock? So we, we, we understand uh, the questions about that. And um, you know, as, as Gloria talked about, they really believe that this is the way in which to really get the church's needs met under this plan. Um, you know, there is a very large team behind this project who is looking uh, you know, at, at the development of the site as a whole. And the plan is that you know, right after ULERP that there will be a competitive process to partner with the developer and um, that there will be somebody who signs on to the plan you know, that has been approved and something that works for the church. How many units are you looking to build? The, the, the preliminary, whoop. this is going backwards. Yeah. It's about 180, 180. units yeah. right now. And how many parking spaces? We're now proposing parking. Do you see that as a, a problem or an issue, bringing 180 units and no parking facility? Have you considered perhaps building so that there'll be some underground capacity for parking? Well, we have considered parking. Um, we, you know, th this area is an area that is very well served by transit. Most of the congregation itself walks to the building and uses mass transit to get to the building. And what is the proposed height? How many stories? It's uh, 30 stories and 339 feet. So one last question. Would the church be what's called a condominium partner in this development, or is there another proposal that the church would have? And 
would they have a part of the ownership of the structure? Yes, yeah, so at the end of the day, uh, the church would continue to retain ownership, probably in a condominium parcel. So they would have the church unit that they would own. Would there be any market rate apartments in this building? Yes. There would be? Yes. The Thank you. Important. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank some, you. I have some questions as well. Uh, yep. Uh, turn it over to Councilman Marino, sir. Um, so, and I'm sorry, I stepped out for a couple of seconds, so I couldn't um, hear it all. But I'm just going to ask some very general questions to understand the project. Um, so how many units of housing are we talking about here overall? 180, approximately. 100. Okay. And how many of those do we, uh, are we assuming are going to be affordable? We're looking at about 50. 50 of the 180. Um, and you're choosing option one is the one that you want to go with? Correct. Which is uh, 25, so this is the 50 or 25% of the units at? So they would be at an average of 60, and so then 10% of the overall floor area needs to be at 40 under that option. Mm -hmm. What's that, at 40? Okay. Um, do you know what 60% AMI uh, accounts for when we talk about the price of rent? Uh, so 60% of AMI right now is uh, 856 for a studio, 1081 for a one bedroom, and 1309 for a two bedroom. 1309. And what does, uh, just want to ask 60%, what does that account for in income? 60% of uh, AMI is 44,820 for one person and 64,020 for a family of four. Okay, and just uh, to put in context, uh, it seems like the, um, the median household income in East Harlem is $29,000 a year, and in Harlem is 43000 so even the affordable portion of this project um, seems a little out of reach for even the residents within Central Harlem and East Harlem. Um, and it seems like the only portion of this project that would be affordable would be the MIH option. Have there been any con conversations about more of the project being affordable outside of the MIH? Uh, yes, this is a comment that we have received. Um, so the, the original proposal is trying to balance a number of needs. There's the church's uh, co congregation, the community facility space, the music school, but um, certainly this is a comment that we have received and we are looking at the affordability levels. Okay, just to put in perspective, all those spaces would be great, but should you build an apartment complex that has more than 70% uh, of the structure market rate, the people that would be enjoying the amenities that you're talking about, are probably not going to be the people that are there right now. So you just want to talk about the effects of gentrification and how market rate attributes that or contributes to that. And uh, in this project, it just seems like a very large project with 180 apartments. And for 50, it just seems like we could do better here, especially if you're talking about the fact that you're owning it. And then for the ownership to continue at the, at the, the you said the condo out, is it only the church that's going to be condo out? The, the church will have its own condominium. Uh, it is not yet decided whether the residential units will be condominium or rental. Can you repeat that? The the, so, the, so the structure of the building will be such that the church will continue to own their parcel, so there will be most likely a condominium for the church in order to do that. And then the residential building uh, may be condo or maybe rental at this point. Owned by who? Well, there will be a residential developer who will build the residential portion of the building. Right. There, there's uh, contracts in my district, for example, where the not-for-profits obtain 51% of the property, including the market rate portions of the apartment. And given that they own the land, uh, I just see the equity being a lot higher than the basic condominium of a new church. You're pretty much, think about just putting it in perspective. You're about to get almost 180 units of apartments to build them a new church. The, the give back on that seems really low. Like, like, let's just put it in perspective, 180, and you're talking about best case scenario, those apartments, worst case scenario, let's say, those apartments are worth half a million dollars each. You're looking at almost uh, $70 million going to the developer, lightweight, and I wanna be very clear, very conservatively, $70 million to go, I'm pretty sure they could build their church with $2 million, let's say, a beautiful church. So that means that you would, leave, you would leave with $68 million to their $2 million. Like when you just put the, mo the numbers in perspective, it really feels like the church is getting a raw deal here. So, so one thing I just want to make clear and understood is that the, 
what is really critical for the church is to establish funding for the church to continue to survive. So part of what's going on here in terms of the residential development is to allow for that funding so that the congregation can remain on the site. And not only that, there is the church's community programs that Gloria talked about, uh, which will be you know, completely free and open to anyone in the community, um, not just the people who are living in the building, certainly. And then there's also the music school program, which will be funded by this, and that will also be a free on-site community program. So these yeah. are all elements of this project, you know, that are really Yeah, but like to put, like, just with all due respect, that's chump change compared to what you're going to be making on the affordable, on the, on the market rate housing side. When you really put it in perspective, if you guys were to take this building and get a developer or a contractor to just build the building, just a contractor, and you maintain or retain complete ownership of this project, you can fund 200 churches all over this, this country um, with your message. Uh, like, the give back is just not there. And I'm just saying, I'm just, this is the initial meeting. I'm going to rely heavily on the, on the guidance of uh, Council Member Perkins. But just initially seeing this, this looks like a land theft um, from my eyes. It's something that as is, is very concerning. The amount of profit and the amount that you are going to gain from this and the return that I see is stealing. Um, so I'm going to be very clear that whatever you guys are putting together here, I know that the church is coming forward with a good idea. I'm not saying the church is stealing, by the way. I want to be very clear. I think you're being robbed. Um, if you do this project and you don't retain at least 51% ownership of this project, I think that you guys would be losing. So I just want to have more insight on exactly what's happening. Um, and I, I'm going to meet with Councilmember Perkins and we'll have a discussion. Uh, but these projects have been done already in different districts. Con uh, Councilmember Barron talked about something similar in her district. And you should use that as models so that you can see how you can take advantage of the property and the equity that you have. It is yours. And we've seen people come out far better than this. Um, so I'm just giving you a heads up. We're not trying to be anti-development or anything like that. What we're saying is we're trying to be pro your institution and pro your church. And I think that the return could be much higher than this. And just looking at it is just concerning. And the last questions I have is, how do you expect the breakdowns to be related to apartments? Studio, one bedrooms, two bedrooms. What's the breakdown that we're looking at? So uh, I'll tell you the breakdowns in a second. I, I, just, I, I just want to uh, uh, clarify one thing. Uh, there is a total of a proposed uh, 180 uh, apartment units, of which 50 are affordable. So um, the f affordable housing component and the community facility component is north of 37% of the floor area of this project. I just don't want to ha have, uh, give you the impression that is a larger market rate project than, than it really is. In terms of the the unit mix itself, uh, it's on, on this screen. The preliminary mix that, that we're proposing is, are 25% uh, studios, 25% ones, and 50% twos. Yeah, so can you do me, do you have a pro forma? I wanna know how much you're gonna make off of this project. Straight up, cash. I wanna know how much you're gonna make and I want the church to know that. That's what I'm asking for. I want the church to know exactly how much the other side is gonna make. In a contract, I wanna make sure that when you get your contract and you give this ownership to the developer, that you know how much you're getting in cash and how much they're getting in cash. And then it puts it all in perspective and then you can make a decision off of information. But if you don't have that information, it's, it's, it's purposeful. But this project, it's total, the portfolio will tell you exactly how much it's making. And I just wanna ask, did you talk to HPD about this project yet? Yes, we did. And what did HPD say? So this, because this is a mixed-use project, uh, you know, with the community facility space, there was not a, a funding program that HPD had that was available for it. There was not a funding program that HPD had available for it. Uh, also something that I want to dig deeper in, um, HPD makes it itself available in all sorts of facets that are remarkable. Um, they, they go out of their way to try to figure something out, and if they can get affordable housing, given that that's their number one priority since the mayor has been elected, for them not to want to give funding to this project sounds just sounds odd. So, so we're certainly open to that. Okay. If there's a continuing conversation there, I, mean, I want to make it clear, HPD themselves made themselves very available to us. We just, there was not a funding program that was identified during the conversation. That wasn't available so to, that you didn't find, you weren't comfortable with, or that HPD offered? That, that, was, that was offered for this building. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, Chair, I just want to say I think that, you know, we have to be very 
careful about, um, especially when it comes to houses of worship, there's been an epidemic in the city of New York where because they're in financial hardship, they're being taken advantage of by developers and they're pretty much giving away their churches for very little in return. And I just wanna make sure that we start protecting these, these establishments that have very little experience in development and very little experiences in equity just to have a deeper conversation about what we're doing to protect them. And there should be some basic principles. And remember, I, what I see so far that was offered today is the bare minimum that someone can offer for a development of this type. And I just don't think that I came into this business to do bare minimum for my community. And uh, looking forward to more conversations regarding this project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. We're gonna to be moving on to the next panel. Magdalena Garcia, Maria Rivera, Antonia Soto, Juan Ramos, and Lasana Akachi. I just also wanted to note that I'm submitting uh, about 200 letters into the record of support from uh, congregants and other people. Thank you. Maria? Council members, I'll be translating. She'll be speaking in Spanish. Maria. Magdalena. Oh, oh, Magdalena, okay. Do we have Maria Rivera? Maria Rivera? And Antonia Soto? Juana, okay. and Lasana, right? Yep. Okay. You're going to be translating, correct? I'm going to be translating. Yes. So why don't why don't we begin? Eh, mi nombre es Magdalena García Chávez. Magdalena García Chávez, speaking. Este, estoy aquí en esta mañana apoyando el programa que hay para la Hermosa. I am here to support the plan for La Hermosa Church. Que yo la puedo comparar como cuando uno tiene un niño, que el niño nace, el niño crece, llega a joven, adulto, y llega a una persona mayor. I can compare this plan um, like a child, that you have a child and then you have him as a boy, and then as a young man, and then and as an adult. Y la hermosa ha, cum ha cumplido 81 años en esa área. La Hermosa has been in, the, in that area 81 years. Donde hemos trabajado unido con la comunidad de Harlem. And we have been working, uh, we have been united in working with the community of Harlem. Y lo que yo quiero expresar en esta mañana es que eh, si a nosotros nos aprueban este proyecto, Nosotros estamos con todo el corazón nuestro. Uh, and what, we, what I would like to express today, if, that the, if this plan is approved, uh, all our hearts will be in it. Para trabajar unido con esa comunidad de Harlem por las familias, para que en el futuro tengamos niños llenos de alegría y llenos de felicidad. To work with the families and the children of our community so that we can in the future have more children that are happy and productive. 
Y por eso este, termino con esto, que está en las manos de ustedes, pero que ustedes son los que deciden. Pero si nosotros les prometemos que si nos aprueban este proyecto, vamos a hacer un gran trabajo para esa comunidad de Harlem. It, the decision is in your hands, but we promise that if this plan is approved, we will work hard for our community. Y también les quiero dejar con esto que esta iglesia siempre ha sido el, yo diría, el número uno en esa esquinita de ahí, de, 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 de la 110 de Fifth Avenue, este, y siempre estamos mano a mano ayudando al necesitado, especialmente al homeless que están en la calle, gente que no tienen Gra a veces. Gracias, gracias por su ayudar. testimonio. Gracias, okay. gracias. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, María, María, Ant Antonia. I'm going to go with María. María. María C. Rivera. María Rivera. Y estoy en la hermosa. He sido miembro desde el año 1947. I have been a member of La Hermosa since 1947. Para mí la hermosa es un refugio para toda la comunidad, porque eso es lo que ha hecho siempre, ayudar al necesitado. No se le cierra la puerta a nadie, no importa la nacionalidad del sitio donde vengan, no importa el color de la piel, no importa cómo seamos, ahí está la hermosa para extenderle la mano. Nunca, nunca ha cerrado la puerta a nadie y por eso es que queremos seguir trabajando en nuestra comunidad de Harlem porque ahí es donde estamos nosotros haciendo el trabajo necesario y como el maratón de ayer nosotros como la hermosa estamos corriendo y no descansaremos hasta que no se alcance la meta que Jesucristo quiere que se haga Dios los bendiga gracias, gracias por su testimonio I can translate. She's in support. Um, <laughs> so, thank you for helping me out. So, we're moving on. Uh, Lasana, if you can go there. Good morning, Chair Moya and members of the subcommittee. My name, as you already have uh, stated, is Lasana Akachi, and I have been a member of SEIU Local 32BJ for more than seven years. And I've also been a longtime resident of Harlem. I'm here on behalf of my union and the 2,500 members who live and work in Community District 10 to testify in support of this project. We are pleased to report that La Hamosa Christian Church has made a credible commitment to provide prevailing wage building service jobs for the future workers at this site. Since local members of the community typically fill most of these jobs, the new jobs created by this project will allow workers and their families to continue to afford to live in our increasingly expensive community. We see this project as an example of responsible development with its creation of much needed permanently, permanently affordable housing and the church's commitment to community benefits. The community benefit that stands out the most to me is the church's partnership with the Manhattan School of Music. The church's current building holds a rich jazz history, and I believe this partnership will help continue to carry Harlem's musical spirit and influence. The residents who have historically called Harlem home fuel this culture in history. Our resiliency is what makes Harlem special. La Hamosa Christian Church is an institution in Harlem and should be granted this rezoning so it can continue to provide the neighborhood with its ministries and services for those less fortunate. We are happy to stand with them in support throughout this process and respectfully urge you and all of your colleagues to support this project. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Juana Ramos. Mi nombre es Juana Ramos. Juana, Juana. Ramos. Eh, estoy aquí en este día. Juana, antes, antes que empiece, si ¿sí puede eh, prender el, el micrófono. Y, y solo les, les hago acuerdo, tenemos dos minutos. Okay. Okay. Mi nombre es Juana Ramos. Estoy aquí en este día, primero para dar gracias a Dios y pedirle a ustedes que nos ayuden en lo que a ustedes les sea posible en este proyecto que estamos tratando de llevar. I'm here to thank God for this opportunity and to ask you to help us out in uh, anything that you can do for our proposal. Y le digo esto porque la hermosa para mí, como miembro de ella, y como, como miembro de comunidad también, porque allí vivo por muchos años, 20 años para la iglesia y 27 años como comunidad. I'm here uh, as a member of the church and also as a member of the community, uh, many years in the community and in the church. Y esta iglesia, la hermosa, me enseñó a ver cara a cara quién es Harley y qué necesita. And this church has, has taught me uh, how to see who's who in Harlem and what Harlem needs. Ayudando en los trabajos comunitarios tanto económico como emocionales y espirituales. Working in different uh, uh, services and events in the church and the community. Ha sido para mí eh, la hermosa una antorcha encendida en la 110 y quinta avenida. La, la hermosa has been a, a blessing to me in, uh, in, in, in my personal life porque me has ayudado tanto familiarmente a, le, a llevar mis hijos a unas cúpides que no pensé. And it has helped my family to able to bring also my children and my family to the church. Y a dar mano a mano a las personas necesitadas, tanto de lo espiritual como lo económico, vuelvo y repito. And also uh, to, to give people, um, to help people in many ways, uh, both in the spiritual and, and the natural way. Gracias, gracias, gracias por su testimonio. Uh, Antonia Soto. Mi nombre es Antonia Soto y vivo en East Harlem, uh, 50 I'm, años. I have lived in Harlem for 50 years. <laughs> eh, para mí la hermosa ha sido una bendición. La hermosa has been a blessing to me. Tuve un hijo de, tengo un hijo de 45 años. I have a son, 45 years old. Me lo diagnosticaron con cáncer. And he was diagnosed with cancer. Y gracias al hermano, al pastor Daniel Feliciano. And y thank, todos los hermanos. And thank you for the church. Las oraciones. Their prayers. Hoy en día mi hijo está sano y salvo. And today my son is completely healed. Para mí es una bendición la hermosa. Uh, the church has been a blessing to Gracias. me. Thank you. Gracias. Gracias por su testimonio hoy día. Thank you very much for your testimony today. I'm going to be calling up the next panelist, uh, Bruce Jacobs. Bruce Jacobs, Coalition of Rockaways, supporter of medical and religious freedom, uh, U.S. Navy veteran, 9-11 first responder. Before I start, what, why my opposition, what that man, what that, what that councilman was saying, he's not totally right. They pass things, there are people that do have money and they should be able to have places to live also. My neighborhood in Rockaway is destroyed. Okay, so now get into why I'm against this. First of all, a church being in, in charge of it without a contractor, 
the church is a beautiful church, but it's still, what about the other different peoples? When a church wants to help their church, they're gonna obviously wanna get mostly people that are members of their church in there. What about the Muslims? What about the Jewish people? What about all the different races? Where is the, the, the person who developer? Without the developer, we don't know what's going to happen. A developer is going to go to this church, and they're going to offer whatever the church wants. The problem with it is, is that you, I understand building the church, but a church to run a development, I don't like that idea, because it could turn into to build up your church. I would like to see who the developer this project's gonna be. The idea of the different incomes is really no problem, because development, there are people working in the city. Not everybody is dirt broke. The man was talking like, hey, everybody doesn't have money. There are people with money and they deserve housing too. And maybe they want good living. But I would like to see who the developer is. In my neighborhood, in Rockaway, we have a destruction. I want to see the built-up neighborhoods, but I also want to see Thank you, Bruce. the right Thank development. You. Thank you for your testimony today. I'd like to call up the last panelist, uh, the Reverend uh, Ralph Rodriguez. You may begin, thank you. Yeah, good morning. Uh, my name is Reverend Ralph Rodriguez, and I'm in uh, the associate pastor of Manhattan Grace Tabernacle, a Christian non-denominational church for all. And I am here uh, to give and lend support to the project uh, with La Hermosa, La Hermosa Christian Church. Uh, the denomination is Disciples of Christ. We have absolutely no affiliation uh, with the Disciples of Christ. The reason uh, that we are here to support uh, La Almosa and their, and, their, and their project, they, they have been very, very kind to us as a congregation. We currently have been in existence for 30 years, and we've been like nomads uh, in the city. We were 17 years in the west side of Manhattan, uh, 12 years um, now, 12, 13 years on the east side in Harlem, where we really, really uh, love being. The problem, again, we don't have uh, location or building, so we meet in a public school, PS 57, on East 115th Street between 3rd Avenue and Lexington Avenue, where uh, we try to outreach the community with uh, various programs. In the meantime, we don't have access to uh, facilities that are, that are really uh, suited for We have approximately 500 church uh, member congregation. Um, and we don't have uh, great facilities, obviously, because we're in a public school. However, uh, La Almosa has been so gracious to us in loaning us space. We do various events there. We do, we've done marriages, we've done baptisms, we've done women's fellowships. We're gonna do a men's fellowship in two weeks. That's open, it's free, and La Almosa has been very gracious, very kind. We also have office space in their uh, location. We feel that uh, in their graciousness and their hospitality, they will bring this forward. My testimony here is contingent on nothing. They, we've got no deals going on. We just throw our support behind La Mosa Christian Church. Thank you very much for your uh, testimony. Uh, I'm, okay, I'm just gonna turn it over to Councilmember Barron who would like to say a few words. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to make a comment. The project that was referenced in my district was in fact property that was owned by the church and they needed money to be able to continue to operate. They made a partnership with a development corporation and they will have condominium space 
in the final project. The name of the project is Ebenezer Project. And all of the housing that will be in this project is affordable. And we have to be very clear when we say affordable because I heard the first panel talk about affordable. The city says affordable can go up to 130% of the AMI. Okay, that's more than $100,000. The project in my community, Ebenezer Project, is a project that goes from formerly homeless to 30%, 40%, 50%, 60% of the AMI. So the total project is affordable to the people who live in the community because my commitment is to make sure that we don't have gentrification. So I just want to offer that to the panel that came so that there are projects that you can look at where you will, with the church, will maintain a reasonable amount of the profit and where the apartments will be affordable to the people who presently live there who will not face displacement. Thank you. Thank you, council member. And uh, are there any other members of the public who wish to testify? Uh, seeing none, I now close the public hearing on this application uh, and we will move to Pre-considered LU items uh, C190409, HAK, C190410, ZMK, N190411, ZRK, and C190421, ZSK, for the uh, 515 Blake Avenue project relating to property in Councilmember Barron's district in Brooklyn. The applicant seeks approval of a series of actions to facilitate the replacement of an existing shelter with 195 family units and four mixed use buildings with approximately 324 affordable housing and supportive housing units. The applicant seeks approval uh, for the designation and project approval of an urban development action area project and disposition of city owned property, a series of contextual zoning map amendments, a zone Zoning text amendment to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area utilizing option one and a large scale general development special permit to modify certain bulk regulation across the development site. Um, I want to now open the public hearing on this application. Uh, Councilwoman, do you have any opening remarks? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, this is a project that's being proposed over which I have many, many concerns. Uh, the project came before us. I think it was first in perhaps April. We had some preliminary talks. Some of the persons who were here on the panel were at that first meeting. We had, I think, one subsequent meeting where we again laid out uh, what we wanted to see in terms of having benefit to our community and the president or vice president of HELP was there at that meeting, and we were very pleased that that participation was happening. We did say that there were still major concerns that we had about the project and wanted to have those addressed before it moved forward, and we were surprised when our land liaison came and told us that the project had been filed without further discussion or further opportunity to see how we could come to some resolution so that I could support the project in the form that it was presented that would, be, that would have reflected negotiations between the two parties. That did not happen. So that was very um, disturbing that there was not further discussion to be able to come to some kind of agreement before the project was filed. So I want to put that on the record. Our concern is that East New York is saturated with shelters. I believe there are 11 standalone identifiable shelters in East New York. East New York has gotten more than its quote, fair share. There's a term that's called fair share where each community should have a fair representation of shelters that are located within that community. We have more than our fair share. We have written a letter to that regard, highlighting the inequities that exist in East New York. We have not received a response. 
We know that the mayor has said that he's concerned about the homeless population. And we say to the mayor and to those agencies that are involved, bring permanent housing so that people are not relegated to staying in temporary shelters. Bring permanent housing so that people are not relegated to staying in temporary shelters. Additionally, uh, going back, we've been addressing this issue for more than 30 years. Going back to, I think, 1994, there was an issue where there was a concern that Genesis Homes at that same location um, was not supporting a program that was being operated by community persons, and I think they asked for $200 to be able to have a culminating activity, and it just couldn't happen in terms of that money being given to them. There was a protest, we had to demonstrate, we had to go to Wall Street where the offices were for $200, which did eventually come. But it set a kind of tone that says, you have what, what you have is good enough, and that's not sufficient for us. So we're very concerned that there was not this opportunity to continue to dialogue, to get a project that we could both feel comfortable with to move forward and move forward in unison, and that is that we need to provide decent housing, permanent housing, not tear down one shelter and build another shelter along with other affordable housing. We're saying the entire project should be affordable, permanent housing, and that's what we are proposing. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Lacey Tauber. David uh, Cleghorn, Matt Borden, yep. and Stephen Mott. Yep. Please raise your right hands. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer all questions truthfully? Yes. 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 Thank you. Okay, I'm going to kick it off uh, from HPD and then turn it over to the development team. Um, Land use numbers 572 to 575 are related ULERB action seeking UDAP designation, disposition approval for one vacant city-owned lot, project approval and zoning changes for a project known as 515 Blake Avenue in Brooklyn Council District 42. Uh, LU number 572 is related to the proposed UDAP project. The development team for 515 Blake Avenue, Help USA, will undertake the development of the project under two HPD programs. A portion of the disposition area will be conveyed under HPD's Extremely Low and Low Income Affordability Program, or ELLA, which funds the new construction of affordable multifamily rental projects. The remaining portion will be conveyed under HPD's Supportive Housing Loan Program, or SHLP, which provides for supportive housing for the homeless and people with special needs, as well as affordable housing available through the HPD Housing Connect Lottery. The sponsor proposes to demolish an existing 192-unit transitional housing facility and then construct four buildings in three phases as follows. Phase one will include the construction of a new 195-unit transitional housing facility for families with approximately 17,621 square feet of community facility space and approximately 20,345 square feet of commercial space. Phase two will include the construction of a 70-unit building plus one superintendent unit to be conveyed under SHLP. 60% of the units in this building will be set aside for the formerly homeless. As part of SHLP, HPD works with the Department of Homeless Services and other public agencies to match clients coming out of the shelter system based on need and to ensure that the completed projects meet programmatic guidelines. The remaining 40% of units will be available through HPD's Housing Connect Lottery and will be available to those making up to 60% of the area median income, or AMI. Help USA will provide on-site supportive services for all bu building residents, including counseling, crisis prevention, and health and mental health services focused on recovery. Phase three will include the construction of two buildings with a total of approximately 254 units plus one superintendent unit with approximately 2,106 square feet of commercial space to be conveyed under HPD's ELLA program. Half of the units in the building will be available to those making 50% of AMI or less, including 30% of units set aside for the formerly homeless and 20% available through the HPD Housing Connect. 
The remaining half will be available through Housing Connect to those making from 57 to 100 percent of AMI. In total, it is anticipated that the entire project will include 324 affordable rental dwelling units plus two units for superintendents. Housing types will include studio, one bedroom, two bedroom, and three bedroom apartments. Mandatory inclusionary housing, or MAH option one, will be mapped, which requires 25% of residential floor area to be permanently affordable, where MIH is layered with HPD subsidy, an additional 15% of the residential floor area, 40% of the total, will be permanently affordable. The updated transitional housing facility will include a 12,000 square foot daycare center designed to serve children ages three months to four years and capable of serving up to 120 children from both the facility and the surrounding community, as well as a computer training room that can be used for classes. Uses for the commercial spaces are yet to be determined. The complex will also feature a landscaped courtyard with play equipment, bike storage, laundry rooms, and a community room. All buildings will include elevators and will have 24-hour security. Um, so LU number 573 is related to an amendment to the zoning map. The site is currently zoned R6 with commercial overlays. A zoning change is proposed to map an R7D zoning district along Blake and Sutter Avenues and an R6A zoning district in the mid-block, which will require mapping the site with a MIH area. LU number 574 seeks an amendment of the zoning resolution for the purpose of purposes of establishing an MIH area. The sponsor intends to map MIH option one on the site, which requires 25% of floor area to be permanently affordable up to 60% AMI, including at least 10% of square footage of 40% AMI. Um, LU number 575 is related to the grant of a special permit to allow the distribution of total allowable floor area without regard for zoning district lines in connection with a proposed mixed use development within a large scale general development bounded by the development area. In order to facilitate the development of 515 Blake Avenue, HPD is before the subcommittee seeking approval of land use numbers 572 to 575. Hi, my name is Stephen Mott. I'm the Chief of Staff of Help USA. Um, thank you for meeting with us and hearing our proposal. Um, I want to apologize. Our uh, President and CEO, Tom Hamline, was supposed to be here today. He had an unforeseen health event, and so he couldn't make it, so I'm filling in. Um, I want to give everyone a, a sense of the site and the context for the building. You can see it outlined here in red. Um, that's Sutter Avenue to the north, Blake to the south, um, Hinsdale on the east, and Seneca on the west. Um, and you can see that uh, to the east, there's row houses, some multifamily mid-rises, um, and then there's six and seven story NYCHA developments. And then to the west, you can see the elevated L train cuts through. And then farther out, there's eight to 16 story NYCHA apartments. So, in terms of context and height, that just gives you a general sense of where we're proposing this. Um, I want to give you an idea of the project. I want to give an overview of what we're trying to do here and, and why we came to what we're trying to do. Um, Help USA is an organization that for 33 years has been focused on homelessness and specifically family homelessness. Um, for a long time, we thought, uh, as, as did the field, that the answer to homelessness and family homelessness was shelter. Um, I think now we understand that shelter is important, and it's important for moments of crisis, but that ultimately the answer is permanent housing and permanent supportive and affordable housing. Um, the problem is that you still need shelter to catch people. Um, it's almost impossible to move people directly out of a situation of eviction, a situation of living in a car, into permanent housing in New York City. There's just not enough capacity. And so what you need is a place for people to land, a place for people to, to look for new housing. And so that's why you need shelter. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we've faced as an organization, and I think as a city, is, is there a trade-off between building affordable housing and building shelter? Do you take one piece of land and trade one for the other? Do you trade the long-term solution for the short-term solution? Um, and the reason that we're so excited about this building and the reason that we're here today is because working with all of our city partners, we found a way to do both. Um, and we think both are important. So what we're proposing to do is, um, on this site, which is currently the home of Help One, which is our, the first homeless shelter that we ever built in New York City, uh, we'll take that shelter down, replace it with four different buildings, all fully accessible with elevators. Um, we're going to replace the shelter portion with a modern shelter facility that'll fit on one third of the land. Um, and then around it, we're going to build 326 additional affordable and supportive apartments. Um, so what that does is it makes this site the solution to homelessness in the city. It provides for shelter for crisis and permanent housing for the long-term solution. Um, and in addition, what we're doing is on the ground floor and in the cellar level, we're going to provide a bunch of community amenities. Um, so that we'll do a daycare center, commuter training, after-school programs, um, things that face outwards as well as inwards. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about Help USA who we are, how we got our start. 
Uh, we began in 1987. Our first building was in East New York, Brooklyn. Um, our history is in family homelessness. We've since expanded to do homelessness prevention, permanent housing. Uh, we operate roughly 55 programs and residences. That's mostly in New York City. Uh, but we also do work in Buffalo, Westchester, Long Island, and then New Jersey, Maryland, DC, Pennsylvania, and Nevada. Um, who are we in the community? Um, we've, we've been working in this community for the entire existence of Help USA. We think of ourselves in three or four different ways. First of all, we, we're builders, right? So we've um, invested almost $150 million in East New York. Uh, we've built or renovated 491 apartments across five buildings. Uh, we're also employers. So we currently employ 201 employees in the neighborhood, 50% come and live in East Brooklyn. Um, we have a payroll that's around $10 million annually in the neighborhood. Um, and we're also service providers. So um, I think some of the people who provide the services for us are here today, and they're gonna speak a little bit about what they do. Um, but we provide child and youth services, a street soccer program, daycare after school programs. We also provide um, domestic violence treatment and family safety programs. Um, and in addition, we have brought in partners to do medical and dental work. Um, so we're proud of our, our track record in the community. Uh, we're proud of the work that we've done, and we've been there for quite a while. Um, my colleague David is going to talk a little bit about the permanent housing on the site. I'm going to talk a little bit about the shelter. Um, the shelter is, is very exciting for us. It's, it's how we got our start, and it's an opportunity for us to, to update a building that's currently aging. Um, when we built Help One, the original shelter, in 1987, uh, we built it in a, in a world in New York City where people were trying to figure out how to get homeless families out of hotels and into shelters that were more appropriate for them. Um, it's a world that, that sounds pretty similar at the moment, actually. Um, this building was built um, to solve a lot of the problems with hotels. So it has individual apartments, a playground, it, it's safe, it has offices, it has daycare, it has space. Um, the problem with this building currently is that it was built 30 years ago to last for 15 years. Um, and the idea then was that we would solve family homelessness. Um, we would be done with it in 15 years and we wouldn't have to worry about this building. Uh, that didn't happen. And so now we're back and we're, we're trying to figure out what it is that we're gonna do. So, um, first I wanna talk a little bit about homelessness as it stands in the city. There are 12,000 families in the DHS system, which is about 21, 22,000 children. Um, and when we looked to design the shelter, what we wanted to do was forefront the children. Um, you know, if you think about the average length of stay in one of our shelters is between 16 and 18 months. Uh, if you come in and you're one year old or two years old, by the time you leave, you've spent about half your life in shelter. Um, and shelter is a traumatic experience. It's, it's not a traumatic necessarily because of the space, but it's traumatic because losing your home is traumatic. It's traumatic to go to intake, go to PATH, get on a bus, come to a new place, enter a new facility. Um, that's traumatic for adults and it's traumatic for kids. And so as we designed this new shelter, what we wanted to do is focus on how could we possibly reduce that trauma and how could we create a space that was good for children and for parents. Um, in going through the design, what we did was we talked to all the people that have worked with us over the last 30 years in shelter. We tried to figure out what they thought worked. Uh, we talked to clients, we talked to academics, we talked to people in the neighborhood. And our goal was if we need shelter, because shelter is important in moments of crisis, how do we build the best possible shelter that we can? Um, and this is it. Um, and I, I want to make a, a point here that, that all the things that I'm about to mention about the shelter are possible only because we're building it from the ground up. We um, operate many different shelters in the city. Some are leased from the city. Some are older buildings that the city's owned forever. Some owned by landlords. Those buildings, you do the best you can with the space that you're given. Um, this is an opportunity to build the space that's best for families in crisis, and that's what we're doing. Um, so, you know, as we thought about the four things that are important for family shelter, um, this is what we came down to. The, the first is that smaller shelters are better shelters. Um, and so what we did with this building is we split it into two shelters. So it's, it's 195 units of shelter, but it's split into two entrances, two sides, uh, two staffing patterns. And that's important because smaller shelters are more comfortable for families, um, and seeing the same people every day when you walk in the door is better than having a rotating staff of safety monitors, a rotating staff of maintenance people. And so if you split it up, you get more of a connection between staff and clients. Um, the other thing we did is we split the services into four pods. So each person uh, enters the shelter and is assigned to a pod, and that service team serves just them and the other 49 families in their pod. It further reduces the feel of a bigger shelter and makes it less institutional. The other thing we wanted to do is create this sense of place. We don't want people to feel like they're entering an institution. We want people to feel like they're entering a place where they can feel comfortable. 
And so you can do that a number of ways. One is by splitting the pods. The other way is by um, creating design cues that do that. So double height lobbies, signs that say reception and not security, reduction of bulletproof glass, um, quality residential materials. And the other thing I want to specifically focus here is that we're building an intake room. So when you come into shelter as a family, you, you have to go through an intake process. You have to sign forms. You have to understand uh, what the facility looks like, how you get around it. Uh, for the most part, we do these intakes wherever we can. Um, and the problem with that is that people's first experience of shelter becomes sitting in the side of a multi-purpose room with people running around, sort of crazy, trying to figure out what they're doing. Um, the intake room we're proposing for this shelter is specifically built for this. It has a kitchen. It has snacks. It has toys for kids to play with. It has a window that looks out on the playground. And the whole idea is to create an environment that, instead of re-traumatizing families over and over again, allows them to relax, allows them to let down their guard, allows them to feel comfortable. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is the, is the service provision. And so what we've done here, and talking to everybody that does this work, what we figured out is that if you move service providers and you move social workers and case managers up near clients, people engage more in form relationships. If you keep them behind closed doors that are locked, people tend to engage less. And so what we've done is we've moved all of our service staff up into the residential area of the building. Um, and we think that's important because it'll allow people to do the work that they need to do to, to search for housing, to figure out what's going on in their lives in a more comfortable way and not by coming down to a desk, buzzing in, going through three doors and waiting for an appointment. Um, and the last thing I want to say about the shelter and, and something that's important to us as an organization is we want it to be sustainable and healthy. We want it to be good for the, the community. We want it to be good for the world. And we want it to be good for the environment. Uh, we're proud that we want a $1 million NYSERDA grant for the um, ecological features of this building. Um, we have uh, mechanisms that create clean interior air that regulate the temperature. We have a solar array on the roof. We are using the highest level materials to make sure that we're as efficient as possible. So the goal here with this shelter is to, to do it as best as we possibly can for our clients, for the community, and for the earth. Um, I'm going to turn it over to David Cleghorn, who's going to talk a little bit about the other important portion of this, which is the permanent housing. Thanks, Steve. Uh, good, good afternoon now, I guess. Uh, my name is David Cleghorn. I'm the Chief Housing Officer for Help USA. Uh, I've been working on this project for a number of years with, with my colleagues at Help. Uh, as Steve went over the shelter, I wanted to spend a little time going over the, the permanent housing um, that this project would leverage by freeing up um, the underutilized land that, that currently is there. So in addition to um, the new shelter, the rebuilt shelter, as uh, others have said, we will be building two new buildings under the HPD Ella uh, term sheet, which, is two on, which will be 255 affordable apartments for, for families, and then one affordable housing building, which will be an additional 71 apartments uh, on that site. So by building up and, and, and utilizing uh, the underutilized land, we're able to leverage 326 new affordable apartments for the neighborhood. So um, one of the things that, that Help USA has always done on the permanent housing side is, is all of our housing is, is supportive housing in one way or another. And that, that depends on the project and the financing sources. But um, we, we always include some sort of social service component in our projects. And when possible, we like to make those services available to the larger community as well. And as Steve briefly mentioned, the shelter will have uh, some service spaces that are going to be outward facing to the neighborhood. So will the affordable housing buildings. Um, but in specifically, we're going to have uh, a list of services here that, that are on the slide that we're going to provide at a minimum, which is going to be individualized case management, counseling, um, health and wellness services, economic empowerment services, substance abuse and mental health services, um, as well as youth programming, after school arts programs, and other recreational uh, activities for the children that are going to be growing up in the permanent housing. So if we take a look at the uh, ground floor uh, of, of the building, this is the street level, uh, you, can, you can get a sense of this, the use of space on this block. The one corner in the upper right, which is not highlighted in any color, is not part of the site. That's a, uh, an apartment building that is owned by somebody else. Um, we're going to have retail on either end of the block. Um, we intend to have that retail uh, be priced either either free or very low uh, to um, encourage local businesses or nonprofits to to take that space and, and utilize it and 
Um, hopefully, uh, if there's enough demand, we can divide that space and make it into for, for multiple users. Um, the daycare in the in the shelter and the computer training center in the in the shelter are both outward facing. Will be available for people in the community as well as shelter residents. So if we take a look at our garden level. Um, one of the things that's interesting about this site is when it was originally built, it has, a, it has an interior courtyard now, but underneath that courtyard is whatever was buried in the ground back in 1987, urban fill. Um, so we plan to take, uh, dig that area out. We'll go down a level, which will allow light and air to get into what would normally be a cellar level um, so that we can put um, community facility spaces, community rooms, offices, the daycare, um, and youth uh, programs that will open up onto this courtyard uh, to make that an asset. Um, I want to say that um, you can see in the in the in the blue building, which is the supportive housing building, that we're in, intending to have a local. Uh, we're intending to create space for youth services. One of the things that we've learned in 30 plus years of doing permanent housing for families is that uh, when people move in, they stay forever because it's permanent housing. When they move in with a a young child, that child grows up there. So our, our youth services need to grow and adapt as the children grow up and adapt. And we'll be looking for, for local partners and collaborations on using that space. So we take a, a real quick look at what we think the building, what the building will look like. This is, the, this first view is looking, um, if you're standing on the corner of, of Sutter Avenue, of Blake and Snedeker looking up Sutter, uh, looking up towards Sutter. The building in the forefront is one of the Ella buildings, uh, along with uh, the mid block and the shelters at the far end. The next slide is looking the opposite direction to give you a sense of what the street level would look like with what we're referring to as masonette units. So these are apartments that on the ground floor, the doors open up onto the street with, with small yards. Um, we're doing this as an homage to the row houses across the street, it also sets the building back further from the street so it creates a more open and airy field um, and allows people a little bit of private outdoor space, although uh, we do intend to take care of the, um, the landscaping of it from, from our side of things. And then the last rendering is the other side of the street, which is, which is uh, Hinsdale Street. So this is looking up the street from Blake in Hensdale. Again, this is an Ella building, the supportive housing building, and then the shelter at the far end. If you look close enough, you can, you can see some of the solar arrays, which we're, which we're really excited about. That'll be on multiple buildings, but they just come through on this particular rendering. As we move inside into the courtyard, I mentioned that we dug out the courtyard to create more space, more usable space for, for residents and for um, um, activities. So this is um, this is one of the views. Um, really, there's not going to be um, any particular programming here. It'll be like a park. People can um, play, hang out, read books, just relax outside, um, be with their families and their friends. The next view of the courtyard is looking the opposite direction. The one interesting feature here that 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 I think is cool anyway is. Um, I mentioned that we have the one building that we don't own. Um, so rather than uh, digging down below the foundation of that building where we would have to underpin that building for them, we're going to leave the courtyard elevation where it currently is, which creates this interesting little hill at the far end of the courtyard, which if uh, any of you have children, small children especially, all you need is a hill sometimes and, and you can have hours of enjoyment. Um, the next slide really talks about the sustainability. We, we, we want these projects as we build new buildings to be green and to uh, carry a light footprint environmentally. So to that end, um, the Ella buildings are expected to meet passive house criteria and the supportive housing building will be built to NYSERDA tier two standards. Uh, and as Steve mentioned, we recently were awarded a NYSERDA $1 million Building of Excellence Award for the shelter, which allows us to do sustainability um, efforts at the shelter that we normally wouldn't be able to do in a, in a non-permanent housing setting. The next slide uh, just sort of outlines some of our community outreach. These projects take a lot of a lot of hands and take a lot of collaboration. So the dates are listed here for when we 
met preliminarily and, and informally with the community board and the borough president, city planning, and the council member. And finally, um, project, we feel like the project has a lot of benefits. Um, it helps the city address the, the homelessness crisis by replacing an aging shelter with a modern trauma-informed facility. Uh, we create two, 326 permanent affordable housing units, and while it's not on here um, because it's not 100% permanent yet, but of that 326 units, approximately 120 of those will be set aside for formerly homeless, so that's directly into permanent housing for 120 households. Um, improving the urban design and the pedestrian experience on the block, um, bringing retail and community facility space to the area, and creating jobs for local residents and MWBE businesses. So um, at that, we will stop here and uh, take any questions that you have, but thank you very much for allowing us to go through the presentation. Great, thank you. Just a, a few questions before I turn it over to um, Council Member Barron. Uh, on the affordability, uh, can we just go back to that? What, what are the levels of affordability for each of the proposed buildings within the development? Sure, so I can answer that. Um, there's one building that's gonna be supportive housing through our supportive housing loan program. And so requirements for that are that 60% of the units be set aside for the formerly homeless um, who've been identified as being in need of the specific um, supportive services that they'll offer. And then 40% of the units will be affordable um, at up to 60% of AMI. So that's for the supportive housing building, which is um, 70 affordable units and one super unit. Um, and then there will be two buildings that will be financed through our ELLA term sheet, um, the extremely low, low income affordability. Um, so th those buildings are pretty far out from closing. So right now we're just giving a, a range. We're committed to having 50% of the units at or below 50% of AMI, and that's inclusive of a set aside of 30% for the formerly homeless and then 50% of the units um, from 60 to 100% of AMI. Got it, okay. Uh, what are the bedroom mixes at each of these levels of affordability? Um, I don't think we have that level of specificity right now, but I can tell you the supportive um, building is, will be studios, and then the Ellas will have a range of studios, one, two, and three bedroom apartments. Actually, the affordable units in the supportive um, will also have a range of units. The supportive units are studios, and then the affordable have also a range of one, two, and three. Okay. Um, on the commercial space, what tenants use have uh, you considered for the proposed uh, ground floor commercial space? We, we've not spoken with anybody in particular. We've decided to have, for the process, that we're in now to have it zoned as, or, or to have it as a commercial space rather than a community facility space so that we have more flexibility with the end user. Um, but we intend to um, work with some of our partners in the, in the local community to um, find users for that space um, that would be hopefully more along the lines of nonprofits or, or other groups that, that need that kind of space rather than, um, um, well, we're, we're, we'd be prevented from any sort of um, retail that, that wasn't a benefit to the community under our, under our use agreements with the city. Okay. And when it deals with MWBE's local hires and prevailing wage, uh, can you describe your plan for the MWBE and the locally based contractors and subcontractors uh, that, participate, that would participate in, the, in this development? Uh, sure. So, with I'll start with the second part first. With the with the development side on the on the general construct on the general contractor side, um, we're we're intending to work with uh, Monadnock Construction, um, and they will they have a local hiring plan that they work with local community groups to source local um, participation for those jobs and job training programs. On the building development side, or on the operations side. Um, I'm not sure, we, we don't have a final number of staffing yet, but with 24 hour day security, property management staff, the shelter staff, um, we'll be upwards of, of you know, well over 100 people, and um, we expect most of those jobs will come from the local area. So you can't describe your plan for local hiring now? You're the, saying? On the general contracting yes. side? 
Well, the, it, it's not it's not a final plan yet with with the general contractor, but it's typical with them. They work with housing authorities, local organizations, uh, do workshops on site, um, accept applications on site, seek out local um, participation and and job training opportunities. Is there a commitment to uh, good jobs for the future property service and maintenance workers at the completed development? Yes. Thank you very much. I'm gonna turn it over now to um, Council Member Barron. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, just wanna say this is a very, very important topic for me, which is why for those of my uh, associates who may be watching, I'm here on Black Solidarity Day because I would not be at work on Black Solidarity Day, but this is such an important project that I felt I had to be here to share with the audience my position on this issue and to have you respond to pertinent questions. I certainly commend uh, the, the chair for his questions and hope that you can become more specific in terms of what kinds of jobs and what's the hiring plan going to be moving forward. Do you know how many shelters, you've been in the shelter business, do you know how many shelters are in East New York? We have DHS here actually with us. In Community Board 5, so just for folks I don't know, my name is Matt Borden. Um, I work for the Department of Social Services. Mm -hmm. um, and within Community Board 5, uh, as folks also know, uh, in 2017 we, we launched the Turn the Tide Plan, which was a borough-based approach to figuring out homelessness. And in Community Board 5, which 515 Blake uh, is located, we actually have right now, uh, there are 2,600 individuals from Community Board 5 within our shelter system. Right now, we actually only have shelter beds within Community Board 5 for 20, about 2,200 folks, including 500 hotels. So at the end of the plan, um, we'd actually look at a deficit of 914 beds. Um, and to your question, within Community Board 5, there are about uh, 13 uh, DHS sites. Right. Do you think that that complies with the fair share uh, requirement that the city has? Uh, all sites that DHS opens uh, follows the same fair share mandate and we publish whenever but we open But if they're site. not equitably distributed at this point, doesn't that mean that we should have fewer? If in fact the fair share program is not equitably distributed now, doesn't that mean that in order to get back to that um, fairness that we should have fewer? So when the city is looking at actually figuring out how we could actually have a, an equitable plan regarding homelessness, it was sort of based in two components. The first component was make sure that we open up sites in every single community board across the city, which, we, which we're doing and impossible. The second site, the second component to this plan, of course, has been how can we create shelters where people are already coming from so we actually don't further disrupt their lives. There are too many folks who are living in the Bronx and having being sheltered in Brooklyn and their children are and unfortunately in some cases going to school up to two hours to get to get to school. So in our, from our position, we actually really think creating shelters where people are homeless are, and, and where their families are and where their businesses are and where their uh, religious communities are is actually a really compassionate way to think about how to create a system. Do you think that we should, in fact, well, let me just say, I believe that we should move towards building permanent housing. Yes, I understand there's always going to be a need, but until we acknowledge the fact that permanent, decent, affordable housing is a right, we're going to continue to throw money at people, a lot of money at people who operate shelters, a lot of money at people who operate shelters. I, Do you know what the cost is for a day, uh, families in shelter at this point? Uh, well, on, on average, for a family within children within shelter, it's probably, I don't want to give you a wrong number. I, I want to say it's around uh, 100 and, I, I don't want to give you a wrong number. So it's, I think, in, I think on, on rough at, estimate is, I want to say around $3,000 a month, but I actually don't want to give you any. $3,000 a month. Um, an apartment cost on average, what would you say an average apartment for? I don't, I don't know. Okay, it's not, for most families, $3,000 a month. So that's a really great question, and that's something that I hear a lot. <clears throat> right, um, I th I'm simply saying that the city is not fulfilling its obligation. It would be cheaper in the long run. We talked about, someone talked about um, 
the trade-offs between long-term and short-term, to build affordable housing and maintain it in a, a way that's decent. So I, I, I totally hear that. And I think one reason I'm so excited about this project, so excited, is not only are we getting a shelter that's going to be a jewel of our system, but we're creating more than 324 affordable housing units with more than 37% going to formerly homeless families. I don't, in my job, and, and some days it's easier than others, there are not many times when I can do a project and talking about giving homeless families, that many homeless families, permanent affordable housing. It's something that's desperately needed. Uh, and, and my I, proposal is make it all Right, and, and I permanent think permanent housing I, for I, everyone. I, I totally and appreciate I hear it. your numbers no, that no. you're talking about. Yeah. That's great, but I say it's, make it all affordable. It is, it is so frustrating because we're, we are going to need shelter beds. 120 families last night showed up at PATH in need of, in need of a, a temporary place to be. We are going to be, as a city, we are always going to need to have shelter. And the question is, how can we create and actually be more thoughtful? And I think that you're totally right. I think previous administrations, there was not that same kind of thought that went into it. And now we're trying to move forward into a situation where you can create these kinds of models, which I think are amazing, which we're, this is a, this is a piece of property that we're able to provide shelter, good shelter, and at the same time provide amazing affordable housing opportunities for people. How much does uh, Help USA get for the housing that they provide now at Help One? I don't have the answer to that question. I'm happy to turn over to Help. I'm sorry, what was your question? How much does Help USA get from Help One in my district at East New York? How much do we personally get? Yes, how much, what's your revenue, what's your? It's a difficult question. How much do you get? Oh, what's the contract amount for the shelter? Yes. Uh, I don't have that in front of me. I can get that to you if that's helpful. I can tell you that the, the contract pays um, mostly for the maintenance of the building and the staff that staffs that building. Um, so, so I'm sure you get some profit. I'm sure it doesn't all go to the people who are working there. So I would like to know, Mr. Sure, Chair, no, we can ask yeah, for absolutely. that. Absolutely. With, with right. all due respect, we're, we're a nonprofit, so we don't. I understand we that. Don't take and the money home. It but. doesn't mean you don't make a profit. It means that the profit that you make goes to those persons who operate the business. No. It doesn't. No. So we, it, it, it's a standard DHS contract. It, it's Say public, again. It's a standard DHS contract. Right. It's, it's publicly available. Um, we are, are reimbursed for the costs that we have. Right. And then there's a, a standard administrative fee that goes on top of it. And that administrative fee pays for information technology, it pays for HR, it pays for you know, HR things like are that. the people who are working in the agency besides those who are working at the shelter. The support services for the people in the shelter. So that's the, the only who, thing that, that HR pays for? What's that? That's it? HR? No, there's um, there's a whole list of allowable expenses. Okay. Right. So I would like to know uh, what that amount is, okay? If you can get that for me, I'd appreciate to know that. Sure. In your testimony here, you say that. Um, The rental, oh, here, the, you talked about half of the uh, apartments would be for 50% uh, at AMI of 50% or less, including 30% for set aside for formerly homeless and 20% through Housing Connects. The remaining half will be available through Housing Connect for those making 37, 57% to 60% of the AMI. What's 100, I'm sorry, 57 to 100% of the AMI. What is 100% of the AMI in New York at this point? Um, just to clarify, that's for the Ella buildings. Um, yes, that's uh, for yeah, the Ella buildings. 100% of AMI for a family of three is $196,100. How much? Hundred and or, Sorry, $96,100. 96000 Correct. So you're talking about bringing in affordable housing and going up to $93,000 F reaching for families making $93,000. Do you know what percentage of my community makes $93,000? I don't have that number right in front of me. It's less than 5%. So if you're setting aside apartments from people making 93, and I thought it was $96,000, you're talking about less than 5% of the people who actually live there now being able to move into this housing. So you're talking about a form of gentrification because it's displacing or not providing an opportunity for the people who presently live there to be eligible to um, apply for this housing. 
I mean, I just want to be clear that it's going to be a range that we a range have going up to ninety six thousand dollars AMI all the way to a hundred, and we're happy to continue the conversation with you about what well, it would have been nice for you to have con continued the conversation before you came to this point and before you filed. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you, Council Member. Uh, thank you very much for the panel for your testimony today. Um, calling the next panel. The next panel is uh, Kurt uh, Goodrich, Isha uh, Whitaker, Helen uh, Bele. Oh, he's, is he? I'm, I'm sorry, my, my apologies. I'd like to call up uh, Assembly Member uh, Charles Barron. Assemblyman, good to have you back. Good to be back. You can begin anytime you want. Well, I want to thank all of you for coming out and showing your interest, because we should always be interested in what's coming into our community. But I also want to caution you not to be manipulated. Don't let no one manipulate you by talking about how beneficial this is going to be for our community. So what HPD and others do, they bring you in, they give you this flowery presentation on how they're going to create jobs, on how it's going to be affordable housing for everyone. And then they talked about the millions of dollars that they put into my beloved East New York. They don't tell you about the millions of dollars they made out of our beloved community. And they don't let you know that when you're talking about just going by their numbers, always listen out for the AMI, the Area Median Income. It's an insult when people come to our community and say they're building affordable housing, and you ask them, well, what is the neighborhood AMI? And they don't even know. So how are you going to build affordable housing in a neighborhood you don't even know what our income is? How about $36,000 for a family of three? So when they come in talking about we have a, we have a range of income, if, they hear, if you hear the word AMI, area medium income, 50% and below is what we can afford. That's 36,000 people making 25,000. That's what the councilwoman and I always try to do for our community. And if you notice, East New York is one of the few communities that's not gentrified. And they're trying to do it with these housing plans that inch their way toward it. So for these units, over about 60% of these units are going to be at 50% of the AMI and up. So if you have uh, units at 80% of the AMI, those are people making $76,000. If it's 100% of the AMI, it's $96,000. If it's 70% of the AMI, it's $65,000. Most of us don't make that kind of money. We don't make that kind of money. And there's a lot of money, as the councilwoman pointed out, in building shelters. So what's the new homes for black people and brown people in New York City? Jails and shelters. Jails and shelters. Everybody else gets decent homes. We get jails and shelters. And they're, oh, they're going to beautify your shelter. They're going to make your shelter pretty. This is going to be the state of art shelter. A shelter is a shelter is a shelter. And if you're going to build all of these units, the mayor is talking about 200,000 units for the next 10 years. If you just do 40, 50 percent of those units for the homeless, you could almost wipe out homelessness, because that would be 60, 70, 80,000 people in a permanent home 
We cannot allow these developers, and they say not for profit. Not for profit doesn't mean you're not making any money. You know what not for profit does? It puts all the money back into the operating of the business and they put it into salaries. So that way they never show profit. It's always money being put back into the corporation. That's why they are not for profit making a whole lot of money. So I just wanted to come and keep it real. You know, we always keep it real to y'all. No matter how many people try to bust you in, tell you to come, you know, something nice is coming to your neighborhood, we're not letting you. We are intelligent people in East New York. And we're not going to let anybody bring us in here and sell us on a, a bill of goods that's not good for us. So if you're building all these units, look, 250 of these units are for residential uh, units and with this range of affordability which half of it is not affordable to us, more than half is not affordable to us. And over 270 of the units is for their new shelter and special housing units, supportive housing units. We always support that. Even again, sometimes people in my community get upset because I say, now, you know, but for the grace of God, any one of us could be homeless or we can be in need of special housing. So we have allowed especially special housing. We've never supported shelters because you heard when the councilwoman asked them, they said 13, 14, but you know, that's not a lot. Yeah, look at, look at Manhattan, look at some other places, look at the white community, how many shelters they have. Oh, but they want to be nice to us. See, they want to be nice to us with shelters and jails. They're going to build them close to our homes so we can have convenient. Well, how about giving us an affordable apartment? or affordable home close to our homes. We don't need jails closer to our homes. We don't need uh, shelters close to our homes, especially when you can afford to put every one of those 200 people, look how negligent they are. 200 people, take them all out and put them in those new housings that you're building. We'll support that. We'll support this project today if they could have gotten up here and said to you, you know what, we heard from the local elected officials, we heard with some of the board people, you know what we're going to do? We're going to build, instead of a new shelter, we're going to build another housing unit and put them in that. We will support this tonight. But don't come here trying to manipulate us, bringing you here. Well, they're not going to separate us. We're going to stay united because we won't be fooled by no fancy, you know, visions of something. We're not going to be fooled. We want this housing. We want it 100 percent, but it's going to be on our turn. It's going to benefit our community. And don't let them tell you about jobs and all of these services. Let me tell you about some of the history of Help Homes USA, Inc., whoever. Assemblyman, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just we're on a on a clock. So okay, I'll make finish sure. in two minutes. Okay, thank you. This is Governor Cuomo's sisters. She's the chair of the board. It's the Cuomo's, and they said like they're doing you a, a favor. They started off with shelters. You know why? Because there's money in shelters. You heard it. Three thousand dollars a month. If they can pay $3,000 a month, then they can do $1,400 a month, $1,500, $2,000 a month for a permanent apartment, for a permanent apartment. And due respect to the chair and the time, I'm going to end it there. I have a whole lot more to say. We'll have some meetings in our community, because remember, they were the builders of Genesis Homes. Y'all remember Genesis Homes? I had to demonstrate to get Mark Altheim, who was the then executive director, to do supportive services, to fix up Genesis Homes every time they had repair problems. They didn't want to do that. We had to bring a busload of people to Manhattan just to get them to do the right thing by the people in Genesis Homes. Eventually, they did. This is about them making money. They have no great love for you and doing all of these things. We're not supporting this project until they say we're not building a homeless shelter. We're building permanent homes thank you, for our thank people. You. We deserve that. Thank you very thank much. You, thank Mr. you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Y'all can give me a hand clap. That's all right. Don't let them. Thank you. Kirk Goodrich. 
Hi, uh, good afternoon, hey, everybody. Wait, hold on one second. I'm calling the next panel. Uh, Isha Whitaker, Helen uh, Blay, uh, Charlene Mc McMillan, McNillan, Renee Fuller. Start. Kirk, we're going to start with Hi. you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kirk Goodrich. I'm a partner at Monadnock Development, and I'm here today to speak in support of the rezoning and disposition of the property at 515 Blake to Help USA. The first thing I want to say is um, I have the utmost respect for Councilmember Barron and the Assemblyman. Um, it's because of their support and leadership that a lot of the work we've done in in Spring Creek, where these Brooklyn congregations happened. It would not have happened without your leadership and vision. We know when we work in Bronzeville and East New York that we're working with informed and visionary leaders, and we got to come correct. I get that. But there's a very specific reason I'm here today. I work for Monadnock, but that's not the reason I'm here today. Our construction company is building the building. That's not the reason I'm here today. I'm here today because I have family members who've been in the homeless system for decades now. And I acknowledge what you said, council member, that East New York and Brownsville are saturated with shelters. Um, we have an affordable housing crisis in the city, 60,000 people in shelter, 22,000 of those are kids. We have a fair housing crisis. All poor people can't live in East New York and Brownsville. We need to make sure that we address those things. The problem with this project um, that you've described is that it, it replaces a shelter with a shelter and affordable housing, and I get that. The difficulty in removing shelters um, is that once you remove them, it's hard to replace them anywhere in the city. And you have people who, as a result of that, ended up, end up living in hotels in the middle of nowhere, in poor conditions, far away from schools, what I support is a co-location of a shelter and affordable housing, and reasonable people can disagree, and I totally get your point. But I'm here today to just support folks in shelter um, and that population in need. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, so folks here, we don't like allow everybody to clap. You can wave your hands in the air, and that shows that you're supporting uh, the folks that are here today. So thank you. You, you can say your name and uh, you can begin. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Renee Fuller. I'm the executive director of Help Home Base One in the Bronx, and I'm here to support this program because Help can bring a variety of services to the community, to the community with the construction of these buildings. Help USA believes that the best way to fight homelessness is to prevent it from happening at all. And as a result, we operate a large portfolio of homelessness prevention and aftercare programs. The Help USA Homeless Prevention and Aftercare Network continues to perform very outstanding work to assist the city's most vulnerable populations. Our programs are extremely successful, and we have about a 94% success rate at keeping people in their homes so they do not have to go to shelter or return to shelter. The Help USA Homeless Prevention and Aftercare Network is an amazing conglomerate of six very successful prevention, rapid rehousing, and aftercare programs. Our network also includes special programs that help veterans and their families because no one who has served this country should ever have to worry about finding a place to sleep at night. Help USA opened one of the first and original home-based programs in New York City in 2004. Now in 2019, Help USA operates three home-based programs in four locations in the Bronx. We have been extremely successful with appropriately targeting and providing assistance to low-income families and individuals who have been identified to be at high risk for entering and re-entering the New York City shelter system. 
We're funded by the New York City Human Resources Administration and the outstanding prevention and aftercare work that Help USA home-based home -based programs have done have ensured that Bronx residents achieve and maintain housing stability by having access to rent assistance vouchers, being connected to community, city, and legal service resources, and have a familiar place to turn to should they ever need assistance. We also have a New Beginnings program that is designed to assist young, family, young heads of households in the Bronx ages 18 to 24, and Help USA also honors uh, veterans to help them to not be homeless. Thank and you. We Thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Aisha Whitaker, and I'm a program director at Genesis Homes, which is located in East New York, Brooklyn. And I'm here to support the rezoning of 515 Blake Avenue. As a program director, I have seen clients that came from homelessness, and they have now been able to restructure their lives. They have been able to find employment. They have been able to get linked with services that they need, um, mental health services employment services, case management services. Our case managers and clinician works with our families to provide advocacy and support through many trials that the clients had to come through facing homelessness. Um, our families have all been able to remain in the housing units that they have. No one has had to go back to shelter since entering the programs, and we work very closely with community organizations and the property management team to ensure that the clients do not have to face eviction. And we are, we're just there, we advocate with the clients and a lot of the clients coming from the shelter, they need that support in order to maintain their housing. A lot of the clients, they've never lived on their own, so they can't just get an affordable apartment, they need the support. So the services are much needed for the clients and I have uh, witnessed a lot of transitions with clients. I've seen them grow to the point where they don't need the support as much as they used to, but they still come up for the extra boost when they're going out for a job interview or when they're going out just to try something new. But without the support of housing services that were in place, a lot of our families would have had to face homelessness again. And that's something that we are trying not to do, is we don't want people to be homeless. So, you know, I'm all in support of supportive services and re, um, the rezoning. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sherilyn McMillan. I'm the Director of Youth, Family, and Educational Services um, at Genesis Homes. Um, under my program, I have an after-school program, a summer camp, a scholarship program, a college bulk program, and a mentoring program. Under the after-school program, we serve ch children between the ages of 5 to 13, living in Help One, our shelter, Genesis Homes, Genesis Neighborhood Plaza One, and Two, and the surrounding community. We serve 65 to 80 children daily throughout the school year. The program operates Monday through Friday from 3 to 7 p.m. and doing holiday camp hours um, from 8 to 5 p.m. We help the children with homework help, recreational activities such as street soccer, arts and crafts, board games, um, and most recently, we have partnered with the Salvadori Foundation to introduce STEM to our participant. The summer camp operates for six weeks between July and August, and we serve between 80 to 85 children, same age range of five to 13. The program runs Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, the children are able to go on trips and they're able to engage in recreational and um, educational activities. The scholarship program we offer to our residents living in Genesis Homes, GMP1 and GMB2, this is where we give our families the ability to attend a private school for free. We currently partner with Trey Whitfield and Bishop Lachlan. Currently, we have um, three students enrolled in Bishop Lachlan and we have one enrolled in Trey Whitfield. We have graduated four from Bishop Lachlan and two from Trey Whitfield. Our college brung program help our young adults navigate the financial aid and the college process. Um, okay, thank you. you. <laughs>
Were you about to wrap up? If you are, yes, I'll give I you a was. couple of seconds, guys. Okay, so um, we basically help our families navigate the college and financial aid process. We currently have students in SUNY Buffalo, Alfred, Plattsburgh, and Morrisville. And one of our success stories is the first gentleman who went through that program, um, graduated on the dean's list, and was hired by GEICO. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Good afternoon, my name is Helen Blay, and I'm actually a client at Genesis Homes um, with their support, um, what? supportive um, help. Um, I'm here as a witness because I came in from, in 2015, I got extremely ill, causing me to lose my job, a domino effect, lost my home, and I had a, a daughter. Um, we went from shelter to shelter to shelter, and then finally I learned about um, the support staff um, help at um, Help USA. So once I got into this program, support is, there should be a bigger word for how much they have really supported me. I came in very ill, not knowing what I was gonna do. They helped me um, with social service to get uh, applying for disability. With, they, uh, they helped me with um, permanent housing. They helped me to pretty much start my life all over again. Um, when I finally got in there, I didn't know how I was gonna get furniture or anything. They helped me with that. Basically, they told me anything I needed help with, they was there. They constantly reminded me to tell me, whatever you need, we're here to help you. And they really have helped me in more ways than one. Um, two years ago, my daughter ended up passing away, and I don't have any family here. And if it wasn't for the support that they have given me from their hearts, I don't know what I would, I probably would not even be sitting here today. It's been two years and they have been my main source of help. Now I'm getting back on my feet again. I was close to getting back on my feet again, but now I'm really moving forward and it's because of the support that I've received from um, them. So I'm here as a witness that the supportive housing really does help. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you for being here. Thank, thank you for the panel. Uh, the next panelist is uh, Bruce Jacobs. Once again, good afternoon. Bruce Jacobs, Coalition of Rockaways, supporter of medical and religious freedom, U.S. Navy veteran, and 9-11 uh, first responder. If, if they gave up on the shelter, as long as the name shelter is in there, no go. Why don't they just build supportive housing? It just doesn't make sense. The money that they, if they build supportive housing, that would be the answer to everything. My veteran friends don't even want to go to a shelter. They will not walk in a shelter. They'll say they'll sleep in the street or they'll go to prison before they'll go to a shelter. I don't care how fancy the building is. Until they get rid of the name shelter. In my neighborhood of color, Far Rockaway, and the neighborhood East New York or any neighborhood, shelter is not the answer. The money goes into, the reason these guys don't want to give up on the shelter, because that's where the money comes. The money goes to salaries, the money goes to this, but hardly anything goes to the people in there. The money goes to the salaries. If, why don't they just build supportive housing? They come with a big fancy thing, oh yeah, 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 fancy lawyers, fancy staff. Everybody that's speaking is a worker. They're making big salaries. I like to see real clients. Show me the veterans that are in your organization. The Peninsula site in Rockaway, 
was originally bought by Genesis, and then there was all kind of problems. So you say you're not connected. I'm not against supportive housing. That sounds good. But shelter, I don't want it in any neighborhood, especially in my neighborhood of color. Because any neighborhood, really. But my, I live in a neighborhood of color. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for your testimony today. The next panelist, uh, the next panel is uh, Genesis Morgan, Laura Mashu. Crystal Lewis, Carlos Terraza, and Catherine Trapani. Just, if you can state your name, you can begin. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for allowing me to be here. Um, good afternoon to our council member and to the chairperson. My name is Janice Morgan. I am the senior project and business manager for Brownsville Community Development Corporation. We do business as BMS Family Health and Wellness Centers. We um, actually operate two standalone medical facilities within the HELP USA Genesis Homes uh, Division. Uh, we have one standalone uh, medical facility which uh, is located at 360, 360 Snedeker uh, Avenue and um, it's been there since 2005. And we also uh, operate a standalone dental facility at 330 Hensel Street, which has been there since 2013. Um, our partnership with Health USA has been instrumental in ensuring that vulnerable residents of East New York and Brownsville have access to quality medical and oral health care services. Additionally, BMS and Health USA collaborates on an annual health fair, which um, helps us to ensure that resources are available to the uh, vulnerable residents of East New York and Brownsville. Um, in that partnership, we um, and, uh, address the social determinants of health, um, and um, we believe that um, this project is, um, uh, a can be beneficial to the community. Thank you. Hi, my name is actually Cynthia Stewart, and I'm here on behalf of Laura Mashu, who's the executive director of the Supportive Housing Network of New York. Uh, the network is a membership organization that represents 200 groups, uh, nonprofit groups across the state that collectively run 52,000 units of supportive housing statewide. And supportive housing is affordable housing matched with support services for the most vulnerable homeless families and individuals. While supportive housing is a rel relatively small part of this project, I'd like to speak about both Help USA and supportive housing. Help USA is one of our longstanding members with three decades of experience across the breadth of housing and services for the most vulnerable. Their Genesis neighborhood plaza, which is in East New York, was deeply innovative and in fact was the first of its kind. It provided housing and services to both homeless veterans as well as low-income families and individuals. As the council knows, supportive housing was pioneered in New York City in the early 80s in response to widespread homelessness. It's a common sense approach that offers households quality affordable apartments matched with on-site support to help tenants stay housed and healthy. As a result of the model's success, it's now the primary response to homelessness among the most vulnerable. As a result of the model success also in ending ho ho tenants' homelessness, the mayor and governor recently uh, committed to two separate initiatives that together will create 35,000 units of additional supportive housing across New York State over the next 15 years. And in fact, Help One's supportive housing is funded through the mayor's initiative, NYC 1515. Part of the reason for these investments is supportive housing's reputation as both a good neighbor, neighbor and an engine of economic development. Finally, there's no question as to the need for this housing with more than 60,000 homeless New Yorkers in the city shelters each night and thousands more sleeping on our streets and subways. 
If the council seeks to help these individuals and families into stable lives in the community, we recommend that you support this groundbreaking project. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Crystal Lewis. I am the program director for one of Help USA's newer supportive housing program sites um, in the Bronx. The program is Help Woody Crest. It's a 48 unit studio apartment building contracted by the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Um, 29 of the units are designated to the formerly chronically homeless population with a documented disability, which could be mental, medical, and many of them have a co-occurring substance abuse history as well. The other 19 are designated to the senior population. Um, all of the tenants receive subsidy they, um, through NYCHA and they pay 30% of their income towards the rent. Um, the supportive housing program is specifically in place to help the formerly um, chronically homeless population transition into permanency. Um, for many of the tenants, this is their first apartment that they have ever had. So the reaction when we first show them the units are amazing. A lot of them break into tears because they are so thankful because they have never had housing like this before. Um, the building uh, is new. It was built in 2017 and um, the first residents moved in in 2018 in January. Um, they have never had amenities like this before. There's a community room for them. They have access to TV. Um, they can go in there to eat. They have a gym on site. Um, we have a part-time nurse who assists them with um, connecting them to medical services in, within the community. We have two master's level case managers that also provide counseling services. Um, there's 24-hour security. The, pro the property manager is on site and the staff help the tenants resolve any issues when it comes to rental arrears, um, any services that they need, need in the community to connect them with mental health um, services or medical services. Um, and the staff are just supporting the tenants so that they maintain their housing. And many of them have started to have the conversations about moving on. They have transitioned well and are now thinking about furthering into a less support service community. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, my name is Catherine Trapani and I'm the Executive Director of Homeless Services United. I'm sorry, could you speak a little closer to the mic? Sure. Thank you. Uh, is that better? Yeah. No. That's better. HSU is a coalition of approximately 50 nonprofit agencies surveying homeless and at-risk adults and families in New York City. We provide advocacy, information, and training to member agencies to expand their capacity to deliver high-quality services. HSU advocates for the expansion of affordable housing and prevention services and for immediate access to safe, decent emergency and transitional housing, outreach, and drop-in services for homeless New Yorkers. I'm here today to speak in support of HELP USA's Blake Avenue project. HELP was a founding member of HSU when we first incorporated in 1996 and has remained active in our organization supporting innovation and a commitment to quality services citywide ever since. They have a long track record of providing high quality services and a proven commitment to supporting and uplifting low income New Yorkers across the city with high quality eviction prevention, shelter, housing and other services. When I first learned about this project, I was immediately impressed by what it could do for the community and for the people who will call it home. When one considers our most urgent public policy goals, improving the quality of shelters, increasing access to deeply affordable housing, and providing supportive housing and services to those who need the most, this project fits the brief to a T. The project would provide housing for people that is truly affordable for low-wage workers, have a robust set aside for people exiting homeless shelters that is even higher than many on this council would like to require, a supportive housing facility enriched with services to ensure formerly homeless people with service needs can successfully live independently and would reimagine the existing shelter facility for families to improve its design to better serve homeless families and position them for success. The project will accomplish all of this while also being incredibly thoughtful about design to ensure that the families and individuals that will live and work in this space will feel safe and comfortable while making sure the project is well integrated into the fabric of the community, beautiful, uh, both beautiful and welcoming. Um, we were so confident in the project's design, I'll just wrap up, um, that we chose to feature it in our annual symposium last year when it was in the earlier stages because we hope that more nonprofits will follow HELP's lead by providing integrated uh, shelter and affordable housing facilities for more New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Carlos Terraza. 
I want to take my hat off to the councilwoman, the councilman over here, because I am in accordance with the shelter situation as far as that's concerned. I live in GNP2. I'm a veteran, Air Force veteran at that. And uh, they have given me the opportunity to have a residence, okay, even though it's through Section 8. And uh, when I moved in there back in 2012, I was paralyzed, okay? I could not walk through numerous operations that I had through the VA in Manhattan branch. I've been able to regain my, f my legs again, not 100%, but I'm working on it. And uh, Help USA has given me this chance to live here. I've been living in this resident now for nine years and I'm very happy that uh, I was able to get off the streets, okay, and very happy to have a place I could call my own. Thank you very much. Everybody have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. I, I will be calling up the next panel. Henry Love, Ted Houghton, Kiana Johnson, Shaquille Davis, <laughs> Jenna Park, Jen Park, I'm sorry. Yeah. Just state your name and we can. Hi, my name's Ted Houghton. I'm the president of Gateway Housing. We're a nonprofit that helps other nonprofits in government to, uh, to develop better shelters. Um, I'm a housing guy. I agree with the assemblyman, I often do. A shelter is a shelter is a shelter. The solution to homelessness is permanent housing. I've spent a lifetime moving the city's homeless response towards permanent housing. That's why I support this project. The city and Help USA could have just taken this and put a new coat of paint on an old shelter. They could have just built another shelter. Instead, they're using this as an opportunity to build 326 units of affordable housing, much of it deeply affordable for homeless people. It also creates a state-of-the-art shelter. And the fact is, while a shelter is a shelter is a shelter, some shelters are better than others, and if we don't build shelters like this one, we're going to end up putting more families in hotels far from where they live, far from their communities, far from their networks of support. We need this shelter. It's unfortunate, but high-cost cities like New York City are always going to have housing emergencies. We're always going to need some sort of shelter system. Let's make it smaller by getting out of hotels, but we need a decent place for people to live. This project creates shelter, it creates housing, and it creates programs and retail services for the community. That's why I support it. I hope everybody here in this room will. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Henry Love. I'm the program coordinator for the Attendance Matters program at Gateway Housing. A shelter intervention program laser focused on school attendance and attuned to addressing the current barriers families face in getting their students to schools as well as a PhD candidate in developmental psychology at the Graduate Center City University of New York. Because Attendance Matters is tailored to the circumstances of New York City's shelter program, Attendance Matters presents the possibility of significantly altering trajectories of the city's most vulnerable children. Currently, Gateway is piloting the Attendance Matters program in six different family shelters across the city, two of which are operated by Help USA in the Bronx. Over the past year of the pilot, I have had the opportunity to work closely with leadership at several um, help family shelters in the Bronx, as well as Help One. The Attendance Matters pilot aims to shift the paradigm of shelter care and support away from purely focusing on the head of household and to the entire family, but specifically school-aged children. The Attendance matter teams at Help uh, Cretona One and Two family shelters have been enthusiastic participants in the Gateway Housing Program. Over the past year and a half of the pilot, I've been, able, I've been incredibly impressed by the supportive um, and family-focused approach from each of the help shelters I have 
uh, worked and visited, but also from leadership at the most senior of levels. The social service teams that I have worked with extensively have gone above and beyond in aiding clinical support, but also in logistical and social support for all the clients in their respective sites. At the beginning of this school year, for example, help social workers went out of their way to personally escort school um, aged children in the most challenged families. They made sure the children were not only properly registered, but also had the proper um, services they needed from school. The social service teams at um, the Bronx sites know every resident in their respected sites on a first name basis, including the children. I have visited a plethora of shelters and each time I have walked into a help site, I have immediately encountered a warm, welcoming, and humanizing environment. This is an incredibly important point as often the events that have led a family into shelter stay can be extremely traumatizing and often dehumanizing. It's with that that I'm um, very much in support of the redevelopment plan of Help One. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Keona Johnson. I am a resident at Help One. And previously I was residing in a hotel dwelling before I was transferred there with my family. And we didn't have services how Help One had offered at first. So um, it was very difficult coping with the changes, learning how to manage with my mental health, with complying with the HRA demands. Finding ways to physically and financially support my family was very challenging. Seeking the support wasn't so bad because Help One was able to offer us mental health counseling with the Fulton Hospital, which is on site. We also have client care coordinators who, by the way, avail that are available majority of the time during previous um, multiple days in the week. Um, we do have case managers and they are very comfortable to be around. They know us on first name basis as well. Um, the staff at Help USA also assist us whenever we need anything, whether it's for job placement services, HRA issues, family planning, informational services, the food banks, donation of clothes, toys, school supplies, and adults for adults and children. We even face problems as a family. I've learned for myself that speaking up and letting our voice be heard with help one, they actually sit there and they listen and they allow us to go ahead and allow, allow our voice to be reached to the right people. Um, we have our freedom. We have a little privacy. We have our own keys to open our own doors when we enter the premises. And because of the services they offer, they actually help my family get into supportive housing due to some mental sh some situations I'm dealing with. Um, be moving on in a couple of weeks, hopefully. And I'm very happy because this, this facility actually put me on the right path, on the right route to getting where I need to be along with the family. and. I'm so grateful for them, so <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon to the City Council. My name is Shakia Davis. I'm a single mother of three, and I'm very honored and blessed to stand in front of you all today. I would like to thank Help USA staff, Mr. King and Ms. Zayas, for their guidance and assistance on helping me to be on my way to self-sufficiency. I would like to start off and say we all have a story to tell, and here's a brief story of my past, present, and future. Before I came to Help USA Shelter, I was living in upstate New York for three years where I was suffering from pain and injuries and anxiety, insomnia and fibromyalgia, which made me stagnant and depressed. So I started to pray more and changed my state of mind and stayed positive and didn't let my situation consume me because I knew it was very temporary. So I decided to move to, back to New York City with my children and went into the shelter. This is where I met Mr. Mr. King and Ms. Zayas, who I see both as my guardian angels and mentors. Mr. King introduced me to Help Works program in which I did graduate from, started training and completed my internship in culinary arts profession I started to love and see myself accelerating and elevating in. In closing, I would also like to thank the City Council for your time, patience, and all you do for the City of New York. I commend you, thank you, and God bless you all. Thank you for your testimony today. Good morning. Um, I'm Gina Park. I'm a social worker and the executive director of the Help One Homeless Family Shelter located at 515 Blake. As you are all well aware, family homelessness is a big problem in our city. In fact, 38,000 of the almost 60,000 people living in shelters in New York City are living there as a family unit, and over 21,000 are children. In New York City, family shelters are society's answer to a problem which on its face is simple. Many families can't afford the rent. Each family's homelessness, however, 
is a multifaceted problem marked by current challenges and past traumas. There are hurdles stopping families from achieving their potential in employment and savings and raising their children. At Help USA, we talk about these challenges, get our clients to recognize their strengths and help them make decisions that will facilitate their return to permanent housing and their ability to go on with their lives. We can't change the housing market or the employment market for our families, but we can reshape the way that our clients interact with those systems. Help USA provides family shelters where this work can happen. At 515, we have been providing this kind of service for over 30 years in a building that was built to last 15 years. When Help One opened in the late 1980s, the prevailing view was that family homelessness was a passing phenomenon. This, of course, has proved untrue. The scourge of family homelessness has persisted. And the families that we serve have become even more vulnerable in the face of increasingly tighter housing markets. One of the major problems I struggle with as executive director of Help One is that my building is no longer up to task of providing the services that our families need at the level of dignity and respect that they require. To put it simply, the building has outlived its usefulness. A list of top line items that are in need of capital repairs include the following. Boilers are in need of replacement. The entire roofing system must be replaced. The heating elements in the residential units need to be replaced. And windows throughout the building must be upgraded to reduce cold air infiltration in the winter. Even more cr critically, the site does not have the spaces that are needed to serve clients in the manner that they require. There is almost no space for confidential meetings between families and staff. Social workers posted to our site by the current administration do not have appropriate offices. We don't have a dedicated family intake group where we can meet with the new families who have just arrived at our site, nor do we have group rooms where staff and volunteers can work with their residents. The, the parents that we serve at Help One deserve the em environment that will facilitate their flourishing uh, as parents. They need a space where their children can run and place, uh, play safely. As a shelter director, the building that we do our work in is a tool that allows to do our job, and I am here today to ask for your support and your approval for a new and vastly improved family shelter at 515 Blake Avenue. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you all for your testimony today. I'm going to call the next panel, uh, Bill uh, Wilkins, Adam Haran, Cheyenne Rosales, Daisy Siru, Siru, Daisy Siru, Daisy, Ubeli Terrero, but did you fill, did you fill out one of these slips? Okay, and are you uh, Maria Jean? Okay, and you're going to be reading their testimony, or what? Are you testifying? <laughs> Which one are you? Yeah, I can. Put it in there. Okay, understood. So we can begin, just state your name for the record and you can start. Good afternoon, it's Bill Wilkins. Um, dialogue and communication brings resolution, so I implore help to have additional conversations with my councilwoman and also assemblyman. My name is Bill Wilkins, I'm the Director of Economic Development for the Local Development Corporation of East New York, growing businesses, changing lives, strengthening communities. We've been doing this work predominantly in the East Brooklyn community for the last 40 years. We're the first uh, industrial bid in New York City, the first, the first in place industrial park, the first Empire Zone, the first women's business center, and one of the first EAP centers. By virtue of being the Director of Economic Development and Housing, it gives me a unique insight um, to provide my perspective today. With the Manhattanization of Brooklyn finally reaching the shores of East New York, we've been plagued with rampant poaching and speculation by outsiders. However, today that is not the case. We have a community-based organization that has and remains committed to the community of East New York by providing the necessary programs, services, and housing we are most desperately, desperately in need of. Who else has the answers? 
to the questions that plague our community than those community-based organizations that have their boots on the ground and have been fighting in the trenches every day in an underserved community. The transformation of East New York has to benefit the residents, the businesses, and also the CBOs that are indigenous to East New York. Secondly, we have the opportunity to do a two-step, and that is to recycle dollars with our industrial firms in the building trade by securing, by virtue of securing contracts on this project, and also hire locally, and then also employees will be able to spend money locally. This will have a microeconomic stimulus plan. I, without hesitation or reservation, support the development of this project. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Adam Huron. I'm the Vice President for Family Transitional Housing with Help USA. Um, I just wanted to start by saying that shelter is about and shelter services are about a connection between people um, between our staff and the residents between the residents themselves um, and those connections are really facilitated by the environment in which we provide for that to happen uh, as you heard earlier the environment that we have is not really up to the task that we want to do um, and we expect better results with a better environment um, and I wanted to talk a little bit um, and to provide a letter that was provided to us by a former client uh, at Help One and just read a brief portion of that letter so that you can see how those uh, interactions can really lead to results for individuals. In December of 2017, I entered into Help One Family Shelter with my wife and at the time three children. As an undocumented family, I had a hard time finding work to support my family and was told by the shelter staff, because of my alien status, I may have challenges moving my family out of shelter. In April 2018, I was able to obtain employment as a taxi driver in Brooklyn and began saving money. On December 26, 2018, my wife and I welcomed a new addition into our family, my youngest son. In February 2019, I met my case manager, Ms. Williams, and she inspired me not to give up and to provide and provided me with new information on an exit strategy on how to move out of shelter. I began working with Ms. Williams on the exit strategy using soda. Ms. Williams escorted me and my family to HRA to open a PA case under my youngest son so that me and my wife would be able to feed my family and qualify for the soda program. After my wife and I <clears throat> would be able to feed my family and qualify for <clears throat> Excuse me. After providing an employment letter, Ms. Williams assisted with setting up a meeting. <clears throat> After my family identified an apartment, I signed a lease with the assistance of the AED and was able <clears throat> to transition my family. And nothing went wrong. It went well. Case manager Williams went out into the field and advocated for me and my family for the case to remain open, for us to be able to move out of shelter, I'm happy to say all went well, and me and my family now reside in a three-bedroom apartment in New Jersey. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you both for your testimony yeah. today. Thank you. Uh, are there any other members of the public who wish to testify? Uh, seeing none, I now close the public hearing on this application, but before we adjourn today, I just want to reiterate that uh, all public hearings on today's calendar are closed. Uh, this concludes today's meeting. I would like to thank the members of the public, my colleagues, of course, uh, the council and land use uh, staff for the great work that they do. Uh, this meeting is hereby adjourned.